off week. Um, we have a very busy morning, so I will spend the zero time on introduction. Um, the topic we've chosen for uh, the macro session of growth week is uh, international capital flows. Obviously a big topic in Europe right now, but uh, a long-standing big topic uh, for the developing world as, as well, uh, for, for many decades. And we have uh, three incredibly highly qualified speakers to talk about this and um, bring us up to speed with their <coughs> research in this area. So the speakers are uh, Molly Osten from the University of California Berkeley, Pierre Olivier Gorinchas, uh, also from Berkeley, and Veronica Rapoport from Columbia University. And they will talk about uh, recent research they've done in this area. After that, we will we'll take a five minute break, uh, very short, because the, the, the morning is still a full of events. After the break, uh, two discussions will take the floor, uh, two Gil Gokar, and uh, um, uh, uh, sorry, the name is Len Heisiger, sorry. Um, and then we're going to have a question and answer session. Okay, so I give the floor to uh, Mori Osfeld first, and um, for 30, 35 minutes. Great. Thank you, Francesca. So you can just find the uh, desktop here. As you can see, this is a joint paper with um, the next speaker here at the Orange Shop. Um, and uh, we take our title from a very famous uh, paper by Carlos Diaz Alejandro, or maybe not so famous, but uh, for a good paper anyway, uh, which he called Stories of the 1930s for the 1980s, and uh, come back to that um, with the 1930s at the very end. Hey, do I need a clicker to make the page move, move somewhere, or <laughs> what am I doing wrong? Would well, that be if you just click the mouse? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes, yeah. Perfect. So click in the mouse. On the this one goes forward if you want. Great, okay, thank you. Hey, well, of course, we have uh, had and remain in a uh, period of crisis driven in uh, large part by the financial markets. And uh, if one thinks back to you know, the mid-2000s, you know, one would have said at that time that financial crises are mostly a uh, emerging markets uh, affair. Uh, of course, this was not really true, even looking back at the, the recent history of crises. Uh, the, uh, uh, advanced or mature economies uh, have had many uh, banking crises, including the big five crises uh, in uh, Finland, Japan, Norway, Spain, and Sweden, but also lesser crises that we might think of as non-systemic, such as the SNL crisis in the U.S. Uh, almost 20 years ago, um, there was a sequence of ERM currency crises uh, in the European uh, monetary system. Uh, you know, crises which, uh, uh, you know, look very much in, in the way they played out, like the Eurozone crisis we're seeing today, actually. Um, uh, the debt crisis in the 80s was actually a near miss for the uh, uh, industrial world because many money center banks had invested uh, more than their entire capital in uh, emerging uh, developing country debt, which was uh, in danger of default. And of course, the long-term capital crisis in 1998 was possibly another near miss that might have uh, been as devastating as the Lehman crisis had it not been contained at the time. But in general, uh, the effects of these crises in the uh, advanced countries uh, were less devastating than in the um, uh, emerging market crises. Uh, that we uh, uh, saw uh, in the 80s, 90s, uh, and the early 2000s. 
Now, through 2006, in addition, uh, the frequency of currency crises was much greater in the emerging world. This is particularly true of uh, banking and default crises. There are more currency crises, according to the criteria we use in this paper, in uh, emerging in, in emerging markets, you could ask whether frequency is greater, but uh, we do use a very uh, much laxer criterion for what constitutes a crisis in, uh, in an advanced country in our work. So lots of crises in emerging markets. And in particular, uh, there's this period in the 2000s, which you may recall, where uh, people are asking, well, why do we need an IMF? Uh, uh, you know, crises haven't happened in a long time. And the IMF itself was downsizing staff. Uh, because of its own financial difficulties in the absence of any crisis lending. Now, economists uh, have also told uh, you know, many stories over the years about the structural instability in emerging markets, uh, structural problems, institutional problems, which make them more crisis prone and which make the cause of the uh, effects of crises much, much, uh, much worse. And you know, in our paper, we survey some of this literature just going through a list of the usual suspects, uh, you know, political and economic instability. Uh, uh, you know, I have to say all of these things, you know, as we look now at the advanced economies, things don't look so great in many of these, uh, many of these respects. Uh, so I could, I could go through every one of these and find a parallel, but I won't, you know, time is limited, so we can you know, discuss this over coffee. Uh, unstable financial markets, usually less developed in, uh, in the emerging uh, or developing world. Uh, dollarization, original sin, problems of currency mismatch, which you're all uh, familiar with. Uh, fear of floating, uh, the, uh, the uh, inability or unwillingness of uh, emerging markets due to structural features, again, to allow their currencies freely to float. Well, you know, uh, if the Swiss don't have fear of floating, I don't know who has right now. Um, sudden stops problem of debt intolerance, and other non-financial rigidities. So this is the sort of set of stories we call them. Uh, yeah. So um, the crisis coming after this long period of calm was something of a surprise. Uh, of course, it originated in the advanced country markets and spread to the EMEs. Uh, and while it's a little bit tricky to um, evaluate output responses uh, in and after the crisis, I think there's a general consensus that the emerging markets uh, on the whole, on average, were less affected and rebounded faster. Now these conclusions differ by region, uh, as we'll discuss, uh, and there are issues of, you know, how do you calculate the previous output trend and figure out how bad the crash really is relative to that trend. But I think on the whole, most people subscribe to the view that the emerging markets have you know, felt uh, less effects and recovered uh, more quickly. They've had the V-shaped recoveries that have been very elusive in the advanced countries. Uh, and of course, now some advanced countries in the backwash of the, con of the, uh, of the crisis are facing default uh, difficulties. And uh, all in all, you know, we're, we're in a situation which looks unprecedented since the interwar period. Now in terms of the output response of the emerging markets, um, without, without a lot of comment, I'm going to show you this, this picture. And you can really judge for yourself. Uh, now these numbers, I should add, are based on the April uh, 2011 IMF WIO projections, which turned out to be considerably over-optimistic, and these are going to be formally downgraded uh, next week, uh, this week actually, the end of this week, when the new uh, October WIO uh, forecasts are unveiled. Uh, you know, the U.S. in 2010 uh, regained its 2007 uh, real GDP level, and you can see um, uh, you know, Japan and the UK, these are the 2011 forecasts. Remember, these are opti over optimistic. Japan and the UK, uh, the Eurozone, the US, and you know, all the emerging markets, even those uh, like the Commonwealth of Independent States and those of Eastern Europe, which were particularly 
hard hit in the crisis. So indeed, um, uh, the emerging markets are showing considerable uh, resilience. Uh, we focus on the question of whether this most recent crisis was different in some sense from crises that went before, because uh, you might think that uh, this very, very different behavior of the emerging markets uh, bouncing back, whereas uh, they were, they were um, hit harder in earlier crises, is something new. And uh, you know, our answer to this is no and yes. If we look at 20th century crises before the most recent crisis, we actually see very similar patterns uh, in emerging markets before and after the crisis. I'm glad I just figured out that that clock is not working. Because I'm assuming that somehow time had been standing still and I'm actually uh, way through my time. Okay. <laughs> um, glad I noticed that. <laughs> if someone has a finger, maybe they could you know, move it along. Um, but, uh, you know, in, the, in this crisis, I think mean, part of the reason for the comparative resilience of the EMEs is that the preconditions really are different. The preconditions of crises in earlier episodes are not there, except <coughs> in the areas that were really much uh, more badly hit in the crisis. Whereas for the advanced economies, the prologue to this crisis uh, looks very much like what has happened in the past. Uh, so I think there's a, there's a remarkable similarity, uh, uh, continuity between present and past for the uh, industrial countries. Okay. Uh, the emerging markets in particular entered the crisis with a number of uh, factors uh, uh, going for them. You know, commodity prices were high, their real interest rates were low, they had high levels of foreign reserves, current account surpluses, Many had instituted significant and far-reaching institutional and policy reforms, or changed their macro frameworks, changed their fiscal frameworks, uh, deregulated. And uh, also, not insignificant, is the much greater extent of intra-EME trade, uh, which allowed China, and uh, uh, in particular, to act as a significant um, engine of growth, particularly through its own fiscal stimulus. Uh, an interesting question we'll want to uh, focus on more is the, the role of quote-unquote undeveloped financial markets, because perhaps they were a blessing in the context of this recent financial market crisis. Okay. Um, Ireland gives an excellent example of the uh, problem in the advanced countries, and uh, to some degree the sort of problem you might have seen uh, before in the past in emerging markets, um, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to focus particularly on two things. Uh, you know, Ireland's falling debt to GDP ratio. I mean, on fiscal grounds, Ireland looks great. You know, the, the, the stability and growth pact would have had nothing bad to say about, uh, about Ireland. But the main Achilles heel is this incredible growth in domestic credit. Uh, just unbelievable, which ultimately translated into a uh, financial market problem that the government had to clean up to the detriment, uh, to the great detriment of its own public finances. And this um, uh, sort of smoking gun, the, the acceleration of credit, the credit boom, is one of, our, one of our main themes because it's something we see throughout the world as a prologue to earlier crises, particularly default and banking crises crises, but even, uh, in some cases, um, currency prices. Well, this credit boom theme is, is awfully familiar. It goes back uh, to a uh, number of authors. You know, I could, one could go back to the Austrians, but let's just say Minsky, Kindleberger, Diaz Alejandro, McKinnon uh, wrote about this, uh, these factors in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, there were unheeded warnings early in this century uh, from the Bank uh, for International Settlements and uh, more recent empirical contributions uh, looking at the crisis and earlier crises by uh, Shularik and Taylor and Hume and Sentence um, uh, focus on credit rooms. And uh, related literature um, empirically 
uh, ties the depths of uh, individual countries' slowdowns in the recent crisis to various uh, 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 preconditions, including credit booms. I'm going to skip the slide on that because time is shorter than I thought. But uh, suffice it to say that you know our reading of that literature is that it provides support for um, you know what we find in our in our own data. Okay. So what do we do here? Um, our study is an empirical study in the spirit of some earlier um, ones, uh, studies of currency and banking crises, Eichen Green and uh, Rose and Wiplos, Kaminsky and Reinhardt, uh, that have pioneered similar events studies of, of crises. And uh, what we do is to um, look at a wider range of crises, including the recent crisis, and apply a slightly different methodology, which I won't really go through because I've warned I've been warned against using equations, but if anyone wants to you know, peek at the equation afterwards, I can show you the PowerPoint uh, slide um, in the privacy of you know, the hallway. Um, <laughs> but what we basically do is estimate the conditional expectation of some key macro and financial indicators, uh, uh, both before and after crises. We look at their, 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 their expected values as a function of distance in time from the crisis date. Now, dating crises is itself kind of a black art. Uh, the recent book by Reinhardt and Rogoff, which I'm sure you've all seen, uh, you know, has, is based on this sort of methodology. And we actually went through a number of sources, including our own judgment in some cases, to date crises. And we, we look at three kinds, defaults, systemic banking crises, now, when is a crisis systemic? Well, that may be in the eye of the beholder, but we have to make some cuts. <coughs> and currency crises, which as I indicated before, we date using different criteria for the advanced countries and for the, uh, the uh, uh, emerging and, and developing countries. Because if we didn't, for example, the French franc crisis of 1992 wouldn't show up as a crisis. There's nothing much happened to the French rank exchange rate. So we want to we want to we want to take the position that the ERM crisis was indeed a crisis. So that's in our in our sample. And again, we come back to this question: you know, is this time different? And uh, is there some fundamental difference uh, between EME crises and advanced currency crises? Oh, the problem is that it's not hitting the key hard enough. <laughs> okay, so I'm just trying to generate some public goods for the subsequent speakers. Okay. Oh, so this is the, 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 the unspeakable slide. So just pass, pass that one by. But uh, let me focus on the data, because I think what we, what we have here is very <coughs> easy to understand. Uh, so we want to look at output performance in the crises first. And the, uh, the, uh, you know, the blue lines are conditional expectations. Uh, the little dots are, are plus or minus two standard errors. Uh, so you can judge statistical significance. Um, and uh, one point I should make about our methodology, actually, if, if, you, if you are into this literature, our methodology differs from what Kaminsky and Reinhardt do in looking at multiple crises. Uh, so at some level, these really separate out the, the, um, uh, the partial effect on conditional expectations of crises uh, of a particular kind, such as currency crises, you know, sort of holding other crises, you know, constant. And if you, you know, you might ask, what happens if a banking crisis and a currency crisis occur at the same time, or if you're three years from a currency crisis and two years from a banking crisis? Well, the answer is you can just add up these these um, conditional expectations. So it gives a very simple uh, decomposition. Uh, and the way to, 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 to interpret these numbers is as deviations from the conditional expectation of a variable in tranquil times, tranquil times being the period when, a period when there is no crisis of any kind. So, you know, turning to output as an example, you can see that, you know, emerging market default crises are characterized by, you know, output that beforehand may rise and then fall and then fall sharply after the crisis. Uh, you see a similar pattern for banking crises, whereas for uh, currency crises, although the effect is not significant, there seems to be lower output. Think of a country with an overvalued currency, which is growing slowly. As a result, 
and it becomes a candidate for a speculative attack in the currency markets. You know, in the most recent period, we see the boom preceding the, uh, the crisis and then the, the collapse of output. Similarly, we see that in the advanced economies, uh, a similar temporal pattern with you know, somewhat different uh, uh, quantities. For the advanced countries, we see shallower recessions after currency crises, which corresponds to um, you know, some of the conventional wisdom about the effects of uh, uh, original sin and dollarization of liabilities in the presence of currency depreciations. Uh, 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 for advanced banking crises, interestingly, we see very slow recovery after banking crises. So um, uh, what we're seeing now, which is something that Reinhardt and Rogoff also pointed out, should be no surprise that we're having a very slow recovery uh, in this recession. Okay. Uh, inflation. Um, uh, you know, I'll go, I'll go quickly through it. We use a sort of more sensitive regression technique focusing on medians rather than means because inflation numbers are all over the map for emerging markets. If you start your data sample in the early 1970s as we do, uh, but basically it's elevated for uh, earlier emerging market crises, but not for this one, okay? Inflation, if anything, is below the trend, and that's a testament to better uh, monetary policy frameworks in many emerging markets that were, that were adopted uh, uh, in the last uh, decade or even before. Uh, public debt is another key indicator. Uh, I'll just point out, looking at this slide, that, uh, that for the emerging markets, public debts are on a downward trend prior to the, con to the, uh, to the uh, um, crisis. In part, this is due to robust growth. In part, it's due to <coughs> fiscal reforms, but that is not true in the advanced countries. And this has left them in a position where uh, you know, they, they used up basically all their fiscal space in 08, 09, and now we're having a uh, basically growth and debt trap. If you look at today's FT, you can see you know, the predicament that England is in, uh, which is the likelihood that it will miss its uh, uh, deficit targets uh, along with many other uh, advanced countries. Domestic leverage, as I said, is a key um, indicator for us. And, um, uh, you know, in the past, uh, you see it um, rising very high before advanced country banking crises, uh, these big five systemic crises that I mentioned. Uh, 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 this is, you know, consistent with the Kindleberger, Minsky, et al. Uh, kind of views. Also an issue for emerging market banking crises, but not as extreme, uh, financial markets are less developed. Uh, you don't really see it before default crises, uh, uh, but you do see it somewhat in the case of currency crises. Now the big difference, of course, is from the, for the emerging markets and the advanced countries, in 08. For emerging markets, we see a small boom, a boomlet, and a huge boom uh, comparable to those in the past for advanced countries. So for the advanced countries, clearly this time was not different. This time was exactly the same in many ways as in these past um, episodes. Um, yeah. Just a definition of leverage for the advanced countries? Is it just banking? Yes. Yes. Uh, we don't capture the you know, shadow, shadow banking, so this is uh, credit extended by the banking system. Um, the current account, uh, I'm not going to say much about. Uh, I think that, that you know, what you would expect to see is pretty simil familiar. There are no big surprises. <coughs> Real exchange rates, to some extent, what we find is baked into our very different um, definitions of what is a crisis in the emerging market and an advanced uh, country. So we don't want to make too much of the discrepancy. But again, you can see that for emerging markets, when a crisis happens, it's, it's big. You know, there's a big depreciation of the real exchange rate. And in these pictures, uh, a rise is a depreciation, just to make that, make that perfectly clear. Uh, not much difference in real exchange rates uh, uh, entering this crisis between the two um, income groups. And I should mention that for these data, you know, we, mention, we, we measure 
real exchange rates bilaterally in the absence of multilateral data for some of the emerging markets. So the U.S. really doesn't enter this, this picture as a, it's one of the core countries. Uh, of course, the story of reserves is well known. Uh, emerging markets are way up there. Uh, you know, whereas, you know, before past currency crises, they've had, uh, had weak reserves, as have also the advanced, the advanced countries. Okay. Uh, Short-term external debt, uh, uh, you know, uh, not much action here in the, recent, in the recent period, though there is some in expectation it's not significant. Okay, um, I showed before that there's sort of a credit boomlet for the emerging markets before the recent crisis. And I just want to point out that most of this comes from the central European economies, uh, uh, Eastern Europe, the transition economies, uh, and we actually separated these out because uh, since this was a region that was very hard hit, we wanted to see what its preconditions look like. And the answer is that for these countries, for this group of countries, uh, versus the uh, others, uh, you know, we see a, a bigger boom and a bigger collapse. We see a huge increase in domestic credit, not much of anything for the other countries. Uh, Uh, we see uh, current account deficits in uh, Eastern Europe, surpluses uh, elsewhere. Uh, we see a more short-term debt in Eastern Europe, nothing much elsewhere. And, uh, you know, on the exchange rate front, there's really not much to say to these countries, not much of a, uh, a difference. Now, um, so, you know, we can see that some variables, particularly domestic credit, uh, seem to foreshadow crises. And one of the questions you might ask is, um, uh, you know, do they, send, send, do, they, do they send false signals? If we see a boom, should we care? You know, Paul Samuelson famously said that the stock market had predicted 10 out of the last uh, five recessions. And uh, we address this by estimating a panel logit model giving the probability of crisis uh, of a particular kind uh, over a one to three year horizon, uh, conditional on the uh, indicators, indicators such as domestic credit reserves, real exchange rate deviations from trend. And what we find there is that the key variables are domestic credit, the real exchange rate, though that's not so important for advanced country banking crises, and reserves. Uh, these seem to have very statistically and economically significant uh, effects. So um, let me conclude because I think I really am out of time now, uh, a little bit over in fact. Um, our results are very consistent with the view that emerging markets improved their macro performance uh, along some key dimensions and <coughs> therefore reduced their vulnerabilities going into the global crisis. Uh, they attain better price stability, better fiscal positions. Except for Eastern Europe, uh, they avoided credit-fueled booms. They seem to reduce their dependence on external debt financing. And they consolidated their ba balance sheets uh, in an environment of low global real interest rates. Uh, you know, previous um, uh, uh, cycles, lending cycles, low real interest rates, what rates in the center countries set off capital inflow surges to developing markets, which generally ended in tears. And uh, we certainly saw such surges here, uh, not net capital flows, but gross capital inflows, which is why, in part, the, the, the uh, uh, in the balance of payment sense, these countries were able to accumulate such massive reserve stocks. But we didn't see the kind of uh, 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 financial collapse that uh, was present in earlier emerging market episodes. By contrast, uh, the developed countries uh, went into this with uh, uh, weakening fiscal positions, soaking up their fiscal space for response, and uh, you know increasing internal and indeed external leverage. Uh, and this was a, an Achilles heel for them in this recent crisis. Uh, the reason why they uh, originated the crisis and uh, 
uh, spread it to the world and why the crisis effects have been so devastating and so long lived. And of course now we're seeing uh, just a long drawn out um, aftermath in the form of the Eurozone crisis, which to some degree uh, can be attributed to the conditions created in uh, 07, 08, 09. Now, coming back to the uh, title, the Carlos Diaz Alejandro uh, paper, uh, Diaz Alejandro pointed out that in the 1930s, the uh, Latin American emerging markets were able to do relatively <coughs> well by decoupling from the center, floating their exchange rates and adopting heterodox monetary policies at the time, uh, closing their economies in other ways, uh, defaulting, except in the notable case of Argentina, on their external debts. And they managed to escape some of the worst of the Great Depression. Um, in contrast, emerging markets have, uh, have uh, integrated more, they've globalized more, yet uh, they've also <coughs> reformed institutions and reformed policies, and thereby been able to uh, do relatively well in the current, uh, current situation. It's the advanced countries that failed to follow their own advice and were blown up as a result. Um, one question we might ask is about uh, the role of financial development. Was it an asset, actually, for the emerging markets to be somewhat less integrated uh, financially with the rest of the world uh, in this crisis? Um, that is a valid question, which uh, I'm sure we'll study a lot more uh, uh, in the future. Uh, it's being studied, of course, a lot right now. Uh, but looking at the recent um, experience of EMEs, just in the last couple of years, one has to ask the question whether the recent capital inflows and the seeming domestic credit surges in some of uh, these countries now are foreshadowing problems down the road. Um, the, uh, 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 you know, there are still reasons to worry about the, the uh, um, uh, safety of financial frameworks, uh, the, the stability of financial institutions in the face of large capital inflows, uh, in the face of potential asset bubbles. Um, and uh, we don't know what will be the outcome of the most recent, uh, recent uh, surge. Um, there's certainly a, a, a worry uh, for some emerging markets uh, that they may be overheating and heading for, uh, for, heading for problems. I won't mention any names. So um, I'll stop there. Okay, thanks. is that the, on, the, on the, balance, the external balance sheet of the U.S., a lot of the liabilities are in the form of T-bills or related assets like agency debt. Um, while on the other hand, on the asset side, a lot of the gross positions that the U.S. is taking are in the form of riskier uh, types of uh, securities like foreign equity or foreign direct investment. So there is a maturity and a, a transformation and a risk transformation that is being operated uh, by the United States uh, at sort of a macroeconomic level, and that's part of its, of its role uh, as a, a center country in, um, in the international monetary system. And here's some uh, data that is based on uh, some work I did with Ellen Ray and Nicolas Govillot in, in a recent paper where we updated some of the similar numbers we had for uh, earlier years. This is a breakdown of the gross asset position of the United States um, as a fraction of GDP, so these are gross assets broken down uh, in terms of different categories. Oh, equity is in blue here at the top. This is direct investment. This is debt, both corporate and government debt. So this is holdings of uh, foreign debts by U.S. investors. And down here is, is uh, what we call uh, it's mostly bank loans and trade credit. Uh, and the last one here uh, is gold, which has been playing, of course, uh, a declining role since uh, gold has stopped playing uh, uh, de facto the role of an anchor for the dollar at, at the end of the Bretton Woods period. And what you see very clearly from this graph is first the huge expansion in this gross asset positions that reflects the financial globalization that takes place starting in the early 70s. And secondly, that a lot of this increase is in the form of this equity and direct investment. So a lot of the increased positions that the U.S. is holding 
is in the form of these riskier assets. Well, if you look at the same uh, breakdown on the liability side, so on the liability side now, I'm breaking down the gross liabilities of the US uh, um, as again as a fraction of GDP, equity, direct investment. Now here, we can break down uh, holdings of US corporate debt um, here and holdings of US government debt and agencies. So the sum of these two things is what we call debt on the previous slide and then bank loan and trade credit. And what I want to point out is that the sort of debt plus bank loans is the biggest share of the increase here on the liability side. So that's uh, giving you a sense of this, of this maturity transformation that has been uh, <coughs> taking place uh, in, in, the last, uh, in the last 30 years. Now, of course, associated with that uh, is the fact that uh, the U.S. is going to have an excess return. Sometimes it's called exorbitant privilege in the literature, since it's investing in these riskier assets are going to have a higher return on average, and it's issuing these T-bills that have fairly low interest rates that are financing part of that and also financing the U.S. current account deficit. So this excess return is going to be part of the story, and something I'll, I'll come back to uh, in a minute. Now, um, if you have this excess return, in a sense, that's going to relax to some extent your external financing constraints. So that's clearly a benefit uh, of being the center country. And that's one important dimension of asymmetry. In other words, uh, countries that, have, that are running deficits year after year at some point face an external constraint and have to adjust. That's a, the that's a situation a number of advanced economies find themselves in right now, especially in, in the Eurozone. Um, and uh, one important asymmetry is that the center country sort of faces less of this constraint precisely because there is a huge demand for uh, these reserves assets that is, uh, uh, that is uh, coming from the rest of the world. So the center country faces a relaxed external constraint. There is another asymmetry in the current system which has been present in earlier incarnations of the international monetary system. That's the asymmetry between surplus and deficit countries. Deficit countries eventually have to adjust um, surplus countries face, it, face much less of a constraint to adjust their economy uh, so that there is some rebalancing. All of the, a lot of the discussions about global imbalances are about this question. Interestingly, this was also the, one of the core issues in uh, the Keynes-wide discussions taking place at the original Bretton Woods Conference uh, in 1944. Uh, and that's something that has not uh, been resolved uh, because there is very little mechanism that can actually induce surplus countries to, uh, uh, to reduce these surpluses if they decide that this is not in their, in their immediate best interest. Uh, and so what is the consequence of this? And that's something that's very clear that we observe uh, over the last 20 years, something that uh, Mori has been referring to in his presentation, is in order to avoid being uh, pushed against a hard constraint if you're eventually facing some withdrawal of capital flows in the form of a sudden stop, one of the few forms of uh, protection that countries can adopt is self-insurance. And this self-insurance will take the form of reserve accumulation. You need to have access to uh, easily convertible uh, hard currency assets that, as a country, you'll be able to uh, liquidate and offset whatever is the capital outflows you're facing. And so we've witnessed a huge increase as these economies, especially developing and, and emerging economies, have been growing very rapidly, we've witnessed a huge increase in the demand for uh, this self-insurance, uh, uh, which is in part precautionary in nature. That's not the only reason why countries accumulate reserves, of course. There are other motives uh, that have to do with the macroeconomic uh, monetary and policy mix they want to implement, but that's certainly been uh, part of the story. And when you want to think about this precautionary demand, it correlates with some variables that we think uh, are, are relevant when we think about the risks that our countries are facing. So for instance, the levels of external short-term debt. It's actually the original greenspan Guidotti rule uh, was thinking about the optimal level of reserves in terms of the stock of external short-term debt. Uh, the, some measure of trade openness, which is relevant because that also tells you something about how quickly uh, uh, you could realize uh, or offset uh, uh, sudden stops. And recent work by uh, Maury Epsfeld, uh, Jay Shambo, and uh, Alan Taylor, which I call the Epsfeld Shambo Taylor rule, is that beyond just external short term debt and levels of trade, it's really the degree of financialization of your domestic economy and the uh, size of the credit sector uh, 
uh, that matters for the amount of reserves that you want to hold. And so measures like M2 to output are very, uh, very uh, um, useful when we want to think about reserve treatment. <coughs> now, of course, the result of all this, as, as I just mentioned, has been uh, a, a rapid explosion in the amount of reserves. This graph has way too many lines, but you, know, you see the general picture. Uh, reserves, whether in dollars or even in other currencies, have been growing extremely rapidly, and those are the ones that are reported uh, to uh, the IMF through uh, their um, uh, coffer uh, system. Okay, so now, as I said, this notion of self-insurance is, is very important for emerging economies, it's important for advanced countries, but it's also very important for developing economies. As they integrate into the world economy, they will have to think about the ways in which they can protect themselves and ways in which they can try to avoid uh, facing sudden withdrawal of capital because that's, that's just a fact of life. Okay, so um, now here's the system we have efficient in the sense that it responds well uh, in times of crisis. And I'm going to argue that it's not for uh, a number of reasons. So first, if you think about the demand for this insurance, this demand for safe assets in the form of U.S. Treasury bills, well, it's a very imperfect form of insurance. Ideally, what you want to have access to is some form of contingent asset, something that provides liquidity in times of stress, but doesn't immobilize resources in normal states of the world. Precautionary insurance in the form of holding T-bills is inefficient because it forces countries to immobilize resources that could be very productive otherwise, and immobilize them at returns that are extremely low. If you're holding T-bills, you're earning close to zero, Instead, you have presumably much higher uh, marginal product of capital in uh, the domestic economy. And moreover, this, uh, this desire to hold this risk-less asset, that's a result that's well known from the theoretical literature, and here I'm ref uh, referring to the work of Ayagari in the mid-1990s, is going to depress real interest rates and is going to create in a world of incomplete markets what is called a pecuniary externality there will be no, every country individually will, desire, will choose their level of reserves optimally without taking into account the fact that by doing so, they will depress real interest rates and therefore distort uh, the decisions of other countries in the process. And the resulting accumulation of reserves is excessive and inefficient. So it's sort of a, there's a global inefficiency in that, in that process. And if, you f if you're concerned that there might be episodes when uh, monetary authorities might need to bring down nominal interest rates very quickly in order to bring down real interest rates. Uh, well, having low real interest rates in the first place is not exactly an inviolable position because it gives you a le uh, a less margin in order to avoid something like a global liquidity trap. So for these reasons, the excessive demand that's coming from the lack of uh, sophistic more sophisticated uh, uh, instruments for countries to have access to to obtain liquidity is something that is inefficient. On the supply side, there is also something that we've seen very vividly in the current crisis. There is also a sense in which uh, uh, this environment creates inefficiencies. And here, I want to uh, um, um, refer you to some of the recent literature. Um, there are a number of mechanisms by which, if you have low interest rates, for instance, that can encourage uh, uh, leverage in the financial sector, therefore it can encourage risk-taking and financial fragility in the financial sector. Uh, it can increase the search for yield. There are a number of papers that document from a theoretical point of view the particular mechanisms through which this can happen. And this search for yield, again, is something that might increase the financial fragility in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, various uh, economies. And uh, an environment with low interest rates and high economic growth is also an environment where uh, there can be emergence of financial bubbles, in other words, assets that uh, are, whose value is not determined by their fundamental payoff, but by their expected resale value. And when these financial bubbles uh, crash, then again, uh, you have financial, financial instability. And so here I've listed some of the uh, uh, contributions more on the theoretical side that sort of document this, this uh, potential linkages. Um, the, on, the, on the supply side still, what we've seen in the recent crisis is there was such a huge demand for the safe assets that the financial sector in a number of countries, and in particular in the US, which was the core country, sprung into action trying to generate assets that would look uh, uh, like T-bills, walk like T-bills, and quack like T-bills, uh, but weren't T-bills. 
and we call them the uh, AAA tranche of uh, structured credit products, which were supposed to be as safe as TBLs, but of course weren't. And if you look more uh, closely here at the, at the European uh, um, uh, Union, you might argue that the same process was, uh, 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 was at play in rating uh, Greek government debt as if it were German government debt. So this expansion in the supply of quasi-safe asset is sort of a natural response to the financial system that faces a very strong demand, but in an environment in which perhaps there is not enough monitoring, then there isn't enough separation of what is really risky and what is not. And the, the crisis, of course, is part of the process of sorting this out. Okay, so here's a, a, an illustration of this uh, increase in the supply of quasi-safe assets. This is taken from a recent paper by uh, ben Bernanke and various co-authors at the uh, Federal Reserve, uh, the U.S. Federal Reserve, and you see on uh, the left part you have changes in total outstanding what they call AAA rated securities, which includes uh, residential mortgage-backed securities, AAA corporates, uh, and then agency debt. This is the blue line here, and treasuries. And so between 1998 and 2002 you had a huge increase in this AAA securities. A lot of it is agencies. This is Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. This is the uh, uh, securitization of prime mortgages in the US. The uh, bars on the left here represent the holdings by various foreigners and the, the change in the holdings by various foreigners. And you see that they were buying the agencies. They were buying some of the uh, residential mortgage-backed securities. Now, move the clock forward to 2003, 2007. And a lot of the increase in this sort of AAA assets is actually coming from uh, the structured credit products, and a lot of the uh, a lot of that increase actually end up being held by by foreigners. So there's a huge demand coming from the rest of the world looking for this uh, AAA uh, type assets over that period, but that sort of search is not is not disappeared, and uh, uh, a lot of countries got swallowed by uh, by that process. Now, how did the international monetary system perform during the crisis? Here, there are a number of, uh, a number of things we can point to uh, that actually tell us that it performed pretty well. So first, there was uh, unprecedented levels of cooperation and coordination in both monetary and fiscal policy. There were decisions taken by the major central banks of, uh, of the world, the Federal Reserve, the, the ECB, the Bank of Japan, uh, Bank of England, uh, in coordinated interest rate cuts, especially uh, after the Lehman Brothers collapse in September, so a, a massive interest rate cut in October 2008. There was also, of course, coordinated fiscal expansion in, uh, in the spring of uh, 2009 with, at the impulse of the IMF and also the uh, G20 and the, uh, uh, with the, the London summit that sort of uh, finalized uh, this outcome. Uh, there is also an increased provision of liquidity through uh, two sources, mostly uh, through an increase in resources available by the, uh, uh, by the IMF, increasing the firepower of the IMF, which until the financial crisis was an institution in search of clients, and it sort of changed overnight. Um, but also through uh, uh, the central bank swap lines, which has been a very effective way in which the provision of global liquidity was uh, distributed uh, around the world. And here I want to show you two uh, tables very quickly. Uh, one is, this first one is the, just a, a, a list of all the outstanding bilateral uh, central bank swap lines. So the dollar swaps are established with uh, a, a long list of uh, foreign central banks, most importantly with the euro area without any cap here, Japan, UK, Switzerland, but also if you go down the list, including some emerging market economies like uh, Mexico, Brazil, uh, um, and, uh, uh, you know, I don't know how you want to uh, count South Korea here, but the, federal, the, the U.S. Federal Reserve has extended li liquidity to a number of uh, foreign countries. Uh, then other central banks also increase liquidity. The interesting part here is the renminbi swaps that were made available by the People's Bank of China and provided liquidity to uh, a, a number of uh, other emerging, uh, emerging and developing countries. Um, uh, during that period. And that network, which you can see graphically represented here, is grew spontaneously, very, very quickly, and became very sizable uh, in terms of the amounts involved. You know, the, the US Federal Reserve ECB swap line grew uh, 
to be uh, of the order of $300 billion at the peak. And so that's really a very significant amount of resources that were available. Um, now, one of the mechanisms that we documented in some work we did is that part of the process of providing liquidity, if you're doing this liquidity provision, if you're doing maturity transformation, is you stand to suffer losses. The center country stands to suffer losses when there is a global uh, crisis event. And, and this is exactly what we see here. So, you know, we say in a recent paper that I have again with Anne and Nicola Govio, we say, well, maybe there is exorbitant privilege, but there is also what we call exorbitant duty, that you stand ready to suffer uh, these losses at uh, times of crisis. And here's a sort of a heat map. I don't know if you can really see the colors, uh, but here's a heat map of the losses that and gains that were realized during the financial crisis. So this is between 2007 Q4 and 2009 uh, Q1. So really the, 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 the most acute phase of the financial crisis. And uh, the dark red represent the, the size of the losses. I think this is in excess of 400 billion US dollars uh, during that period. Um, the green represent gains. Light green means gains between zero and 400 billion dollars. Uh, dark green is gains in excess of that, and in our sample of countries, there's only one country that uh, uh, experienced that, and that's, that's the UK, uh, which uh, 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 experienced very significant gains, especially on its debt portfolio. Um, and uh, uh, you know, what's interesting from our point of view is, as we'd expect, the US suffered these huge losses. Okay, that's what you think should happen, given that it's at the center of the system. There are a number of countries or regions that also experience uh, losses. Uh, Australia here, I want to discount a little bit. It's, it, it looks big on the map because it's, it's a, a big landmass, but uh, the, the actual uh, losses were very, very minimal. More relevant are the Eurozone, Switzerland, and China. And the reason I think these are interesting is, is that these are potentially countries that can play a role of reserve currency, either already, if you think about the Swiss franc, or uh, in the future, if you think about China, and it seems that the geography of wealth transfers and international portfolios is already already reflecting this. So that's an interesting that's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Um, now, <clears throat> going forward, what do we expect? What should we see? And here I'm going to be uh, a little bit more speculative, but trying to uh, um, you know present arguments based on um, what we advance in the report that we wrote. Um, there are two things that we think are going to be important here. One is that this great convergence that we see already taking place with emerging developing countries catching up to uh, the advanced economies. Uh, advanced economies themselves will find uh, that they have, as Mori mentioned, exhausted their fiscal space. So uh, their, their engines of growth are, uh, for the time being, are relatively stalled. They, they have limited ways of stimulating their economy. And if you take a longer perspective, the demographic trends are somewhat adverse and, and also are putting some strain on their, on their resources. And the, the result of this is that you expect advanced economies to become smaller, the original set of advanced economies. Of course, if you include countries as a graduate, then of course, by definition, it cannot become smaller. But you know, the original set of advanced economies to become smaller in relation to emerging economies are taking a bigger share of, of world output. Um, and that is important because it, um, it potentially can create what we call a modern version of the Triffin uh, Dilemma. And the Triffin Dilemma is this observation that uh, uh, Robert Triffin made in the 1960s about the Bretton Woods system, where he said that even though uh, the dollar was pegged to gold, there would be a time when the US would be unable to guarantee uh, the conversion of dollar holdings into gold because the demand for dollar assets was growing with the world economy, but the holdings of gold of the US economy were not growing with the world economy. And so at some point, there would be a discrepancy between, between the two. Now, there is a modern form of this dilemma that is also present in the system we have, because if you think about the US dollar reserve asset, the US T-bills, this is backed by the US fiscal capacity. And as the US economy becomes smaller in a bigger world, the US fiscal capacity will by nature, become insufficient to provide enough liquidity for the world economy. And so there has to be a time when uh, there will be some concern about the ability of the US to guarantee, based on its fiscal, future fiscal surpluses, 
uh, the value of the US T-bills. Now, we're not there yet, but eventually we can anticipate that we will reach, we will reach that point. Um, so in other words, the fiscal capacity of the dollar here is not unlimited. And uh, what this points uh, to is that we will have eventually the emergence of what we call a multipolar world. And the multipolar world means that there will be competition and coexistence between a number of reserve currency. Now, of course, we already have reserve currency besides the US dollar. I mean, I think the Swiss franc certainly plays that role right now, uh, maybe some other currencies as well, but they play that role more on the local level. They are too small to really play a big role in uh, uh, international portfolio locations. What we have in mind is a world in which there are two, maybe three international currencies that will compete on a global, global scale. And what these other two currencies might be, well, you know, if you had asked me a year ago, I would have said, of course, the euro. Uh, maybe I will be hedging my bets a little bit more uh, uh, these days. But certainly the euro would be a prime candidate if it manages to go past its current, uh, its current problems. And the renminbi is, of course, <coughs> obviously another, another prime uh, candidate here. Um, so is this multipolar world going to be more or less stable? Here, a couple of words on this. Um, it helps in that it removes part of the Triffin dilemma by expanding the supply of reserve assets, which would not be just the US TBLs, but also renminbi denominated Chinese government bonds uh, or euro denominated uh, co-guaranteed European bonds. Uh, it expands the supply of this, the safe assets that are in a relatively short supply. And so that's something that is good. And moreover, as the world economy is growing, then that supply is also growing because it's coming from many different sources. It's also good in the sense that, you know, since reserve assets by definition are uh, almost perfect substitutes in good times at least, that means you can have huge movements in capital flows with relatively minimal impact on prices. That's what high elasticity of substitution gives you. Uh, but of course, there is a downside, which is that you have to retain your status as a, a global liquidity issuer. And if investors have alternatives, that means that if they become scared about your capacity to do that, they could also run for the exits and in so doing, create conditions that make it much more difficult for a particular region to sustain its fiscal, its fiscal capacity and its fiscal solvency. So there is a dark side to the multipolar world where you can have both more stability, but then also episodes where uh, countries find themselves uh, um, suffering maybe uh, 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 self-fulfilling types of crisis. And as a consequence, there might be a temptation to engage in fiscal competition, where in order to preserve your status as a fiscal, as an issuer of a reserve asset, you want to make sure that you're more virtuous than your neighbor. And it's always very dangerous when you want to prove something uh, relative to your neighbors in terms of efficiency outcomes. Now, based on all this, and I will conclude with that, uh, I will uh, uh, just list for you the set of recommendations that we were making in the report that we, we wrote, which uh, try to accompany the, the, the transition that we think is, is in the cards, this transition to a more multipolar world, but also try to provide more contingent-based instruments uh, uh, in terms of obtaining liquidity. And so the first, the, in, in order of um, uh, sort of degree of ambition, if you want, going from uh, the easiest one maybe to implement going to the, going to the most diffi difficult. Uh, the first thing we, we mentioned is that there should be a drive to develop alternatives to uh, US treasuries that have the same uh, uh, characteristics of safety and liquidity. It's not a question of introducing uh, AAA private market uh, security, uh, securitized instruments, more of uh, helping the transition towards the issuance of government bonds from fiscal surplus regions, and here we can think about accompanying the transition to an open uh, financial account in China, uh, the emergence of uh, a yuan bond market, and also uh, the issuance of, of euro bonds, which in that particular context has nothing to do with the current discussions on uh, uh, bailing out Greece or other countries, but it's really on the supply of safe assets uh, from a global perspective. That's the first proposition we make. The second one is to take this notion that this uh, temporary swap arrangements that were put in place during the crisis were very, very effective, but they were also very discretionary. Uh, and a lot of these arrangements are temporary in nature. Whether they are, uh, the speaker is open, open or not is at the discretion of 
the central bank that is providing the liquidity in many cases, that means the Federal Reserve, and the Federal Reserve is facing a lot of political constraints, and we can anticipate that those political constraints will become even harder in the future in terms of providing liquidity to the rest of the world. So in an ideal world, you'd want to have in place something that is less discretionary, where there is a little bit more visibility in terms of the criteria under which you can obtain uh, liquidity. And so we uh, mentioned that one possibility would be to make those swap agreements uh, multilateral, maybe with the IMF at the center, it would be draining this liquidity from the surplus or the reserve countries and then distributing it to, um, to other countries. The advantage of this uh, swap agreements is that they increase liquidity on a conditional basis. If they were in place, then countries maybe don't need to be holding as much treasury bills on their balance sheet uh, in, in good times. Uh, third, uh, third proposition is to expand the firepower of the IMF. There has been a huge expansion uh, already uh, to uh, um, uh, you know, close to a, a trillion dollar uh, at this point, but this is really insufficient in regard to the liquidity needs that arise in times of crisis. And so again, you want to think about ways in which the IMF could be drawing on the surplus <coughs> countries uh, and on the reserve countries in times, in times of crisis and redistributing this liquidity. And the reason I mention the IMF here is that it could be the IMF could be in conjunction with the BIS, but it's really at the center of the, at the, center of the system as, as it should be. Um, and the final proposition is that those reserves actually don't need to be sitting and earning their treasury bill return. They could also be pooled uh, through a reserve pooling mechanism uh, which would allow some maturity transformation, again, uh, uh, um, monitored and enforced by, uh, by the IMF. Now, in uh, conclusion, I will also mention one more thing. If we provide more insurance on the global scale, uh, we have to be worried about moral hazard. And we have to be worried about the fact that domestic financial systems might be tempted to take more risks. Domestic regulators might be tem tempted to look the other way because they think they have the safety net of the uh, contingent, contingent liquidity being uh, available. And so the only way this can work is if you also at the same time increase the surveillance, uh, in particular on domestic financial systems and on the uh, uh, sort of mismatch, both in terms of currency and maturities that are taking place between a domestic financial system and, uh, and the rest of the world and having a system of, uh, of cutting off the access to liquidity uh, uh, if, if countries are taking too much risk. So I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot for having me here. Um, this is what I'm going to present today. Uh, it's a project that we are working on together with Daniel Pravicini uh, and Danny Wolfenson, also from Colombia, and Philip Schnabel from NYU. We are in this particular project that I'm, that I'm going to show you today, we are trying to understand the, the effect of credit supply shock on exports. And different, differently from the previous two presentations, the, I'm going to always talk from the point of view of the developing economy instead of the, of the world as a whole. But we'll see that there are a lot of points in common with the, with the previous presentation in, in, in terms of what are the prudential regulation in place that relate to what they said. In, in a particular developing economy that is Peru, Peru is not represented in this forum, but you will see there are a lot of points in common with the, with the economies you represent. Um, this is part of a broader agenda where we're trying to understand the connection between financial and the real economy sectors. Basically, uh, we're after three questions. First is how shocks to banks end up affecting uh, the real economy. This is a very old question in, since the early studies of the Great Depression. And, and this is crucial to understand um, how to design prudential regulation uh, so to limit the impact of shocks to banks to the broader economy. But we also want to understand whether banks provide other services apart from just credit intermediation. And this is for us crucial because um, it will determine whether we can replace a distressed, we can substitute, or firms can substitute a distressed bank with a healthy bank. If the banks provide other services apart from credit, that replacement is not that easy because there are a lot of expertise that is lost when a bank goes under. And lastly, what we want to understand is how firms use credit, whether they use it for um, 
financing invest investment, physical investment, what they needed to uh, uh, enter new new markets, what they needed to for production, for working capital, and these are all things that we will need to understand to um, to measure or to predict what is the impact of credit shocks to firms. This project is very intensive on data, and I'm going to show you how we use all that data. Uh, today I'm going to focus mostly on the first question. The project I'm going I'm to show you about is mostly on the first question, but I'm going to show you how we are thinking of the rest of the agenda. So first let me recap a little bit. What are the frictions that, that countries face that can explain how shocks to bank end up affecting real economic activities. And there are a lot of frictions that we need to understand because if we want to implement mechanisms to stop them, we have to attack all these three fronts. First, a shock to a bank will have uh, a real effect if the banks cannot substitute that shock with other sources of funding. So in that case, if a bank receives a shock, then it cannot get funding from other sources, so they end up cutting lending. But not only that, for that to end up affecting the firm, it has to be that the firm itself cannot substitute that bank with a healthy bank. Because if they could, they can just abandon a distressed bank, go to another source of credit, trade credit, public credit, another bank, and then the lending to that firm would not be affected. But not only that, even if the firm receives a lending shock, it has to be that the firm actually needed credit to begin with. And this is a big if because we're talking about, uh, mo in a moment of crisis, we're talking about a general recession where firms do not really demand a lot of credit because they cut investment, they cut production, so they also need less credit to finance their activities. So it might be that lending goes down, but the firms didn't need that credit to begin with. So for a shock to bank to end up affecting the firms, all these three things need to happen. We're going to try to identify these problems and talk about a specific outcome of the firm, which is exports. And the reason we're focusing on export is first because it's interesting in itself. Export during the recent crisis dropped by 23% world export, way more than, than world GDP. And it also happened together with in, in all countries, in all products. So this simultaneity of export drop tells us there was something happening and a lot of researchers are uh, looking at credit because export is so demanding on credit that maybe what, what provoked this, uh, this coordination in the drop in export is coming from the credit side. The other reason we care a lot about export <coughs> is because it will allow us to control very well for demand because we have for export the destination and the product of the export so we can, we can do a lot of things with that. Um, as I told you, I'm going to focus on Peru, and the reason why I think is, uh, Peru is an interesting case to discuss here is because the things I'm going to talk about, I think, are shared with, with, with the countries <coughs> represented here. Peru was not, but not an important economic actor in Peru was involved in the subprime uh, crisis. They didn't even have the AAA uh, uh, no, nothing of the sort, but they were really shocked. And they were shocked mainly through, through two ways. Um, first, this is something that happened to all emerging economies. Capital inflows reverse back to the, to the developed economies once you see uh, volatility in the market. What we see here is a portfolio flow inflows to the Peruvian banking sector that were growing a lot up to mid-2008, uh, 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 and mm -hmm. then they reversed back to the developed uh, economies afterwards. And the other way in which Peru was affected is uh, by the, the reduction in the international demand for Peruvian products and the drop in commodity prices. What we see here is, is exports by Peru in red, we have the value of the exports. In blue, we have the volume of the exports. What we see is that in, in the second half of 2008 and 2009, the export dropped a lot, particularly in value. Peru is, a, is an exporter of commodities, and the price of commodities crashed. I'm putting these lines here. This line represents the time of the reversal of capital flows in the, the, into the Peruvian banking sector. So we're going to compare a lot 
what happened in the, in the period before and after the reversal of capital flows. We're focusing on, uh, on Peru, although these things are common to many emerging economies because I'm going to show you we have really good data for Peru. The data that we're going to look at is the balance sheets of the banks that will allow us to look at um, how the shock hit these banks in the Peruvian banking sector. We have the credit registry that basically we have monthly information on uh, the, outland, the, the outstanding loans of each firm in the bank. So we're going to see how the lending, sh how the shock to the bank affected the, the credit to each of the firms. And, we're gonna ha and we have customs information. So we, we're going to be, be able to see how each of the firm is exporting. What products, where, when, the price. So we're going to track from the shock to the bank all the way to the outcomes of the firm. This is, this is what, how uh, Peru looks like. Uh, so exports a lot, of, a lot of manufacturers, but mostly are commodities, derivatives of mining and oil. It's big on agriculture, fishing. It has some important textiles, a uh, textile industry. And the big markets are US and China. So this is actually something that, that is common to a lot of emerging economies. China is growing as, in, in, as an important destination of exports. Um, so let me show you first, this is very related to, to the previous talks. As soon as the capital flow reversed, banks suffer the shock, domestic banks. How, is this, how this happened? Well, domestic banks in, the, in, in, in Peru are the ultimate global players. They, they borrow from international markets in a way that most firms do not. So when the capital flow reversed, the first one that I hit are these guys because they cannot roll over their debts. What we see here is the, is the importance of foreign liabilities, foreign debt in the balance sheet of the banks. And I'm putting here the, the ones above the mean and below the mean. What we have here is some international banks, HSBC, Citibank, this visa is Escoria Bank, Santander. The big domestic banks are Continental and Credito. So we have international and domestic banks on the two sides of the spectrum. This, by the way, is way, way lower than the foreign liabilities that you see for the Russian crisis. The domestic banks at the time of the Russian crisis had foreign liabilities that were more than double this, the, the shares here. So the, the central bank in Peru, as what happened with many emerging economies, succeeded in reducing the, foreign, the dependence of banks on foreign lending. How they did this? Well, they had really high reserves on foreign denominated debt and actually on foreign debt with foreign counterparts. <coughs> and all that went into a reserve, uh, into a fund, that they managed to, to, to put it back into the economy at the time of the crisis. So they introduced a lot of liquidity back into the economy, and they managed to reduce the impact of the, of the, of the shock quite dramatically. So this is, so they were actually very successful in reducing the impact of the, of the uh, reversal of capital flows on these banks. So we're taking place in exchange markets. Um, and uh, more interestingly, I find that the way in which countries react to the crisis 2008 and onward, uh, was very much conditioned on how they entered it. So if you take two country examples, take Brazil and China, uh, both of whom uh, weathered well but have policy choices to make. So Brazil enters with very high uh, real interest rates, relatively low investment for a country of its size, and I would say an underperformance in growth. Uh, and now, they find themselves in this difficult dilemma, right? Everyone wanted to send capital into Brazil, appreciate the exchange rate, hurt exports, therefore they had to either try to intervene, which would have been a problem because uh, they would have to uh, uh, sop up the liquidity and then perhaps sterilize, which would raise the interest rates even more and make Brazil even more attractive. Uh, so they opted for capital controls of one uh, form or another. Um, Whereas the right solution, in a way, for Brazil would have been 
to deal with the high real interest rate problem, try to get higher investments and productivity going, um, and grow their way uh, out of this rather than use uh, non-market uh, mechanisms. China has the opposite problem, right? They have uh, negative real uh, interest rates, which accounts for the housing boom, a lot of apartments being purchased but vacant in China. Uh, it's, it's the, you know, it's the play. Also, China, if you look at the previous decade, you'll see that M2 increased five-fold over a decade. And even if output increased twice or three times even, if you want to go that far, uh, there's a lot of suppressed inflation. So China's reaction uh, of trying to keep an ultra-competitive exchange rate and not wanting to see interest rates go up to fight inflation because of this housing bubble and other things really limits their ability to probably do the optimal uh, kind of policy response. So I'm just contrasting these two to say that as you enter the crisis, fundamentals are important, but also they condition uh, what your policy choices are uh, going forward, and they're quite different, at least for these two cases. Uh, second, what is different? What advice would uh, policymakers in emerging markets take away uh, today that they might not have taken away uh, a decade ago, particularly at a conference like this? Well, one has to be the views on capital controls, right? The IMF has done a 180 degree turn on capital controls. Uh, it supports targeted capital controls, by which presumably we mean you want to discriminate against short-term capital, uh, not against long-term. But the trouble with the capital controls is, A, how do you set it? Brazil's gone from 2 to 4 to 6 percent taxes. It doesn't seem to have much effect. And secondly, it's a very fine line once you start implementing uh, these types of controls. So Brazil is now going to taxes on particular types of uh, imports. Okay, they're going for luxury cars, but next week it'll be something else. So it's a, um, it's a slippery slope in my view, but at least if you refer to the Chilean type of tax on short-term capital, I think it, it, it can be justified. The second thing that's new is the role of state banks. Ten years ago, uh, the World Bank and others, their basic advice was, you know, governments shouldn't have state banks, uh, apart from the argument of industrial policy, which is uh, now much more prevalent. Uh, the idea was state banks were inefficient and uh, they made bad uh, decisions. Well, look at Brazil. Benedese got huge inflows of uh, funds, which enabled Brazil to provide the credit that Veronica showed in the case of Peru. India has done, uh, my understanding, something similar. Um, so the view on state banks, totally different. And uh, as state banks continue to be supported in many countries, uh, it makes sort of strategic uh, decisions by government uh, more likely. I'm taking a neutral view on industrial policy. I'm just saying that it's uh, much more uh, likely when you have state banks who can implement uh, that policy. And the third has to do with the fear of floating story, and I wonder what the IMF is going to be proposing. Um, should countries consider, you know, pegging again? Obviously not. Uh, they don't have the resources of uh, Switzerland. Uh, but the volatility of the markets uh, is a problem. So the question is, uh, fear of floating, uh, interesting, I mean, you know, legitimate concern, but what's the What's the policy uh, recommendation? And third, let me end with uh, a reverse set of lessons. Since we're sitting here in Europe, um, even though it's across the channel from the mainland, um, I recently wrote something that uh, I wanted to at least share the core of, of, uh, of that with you, which is not what is Europe doing wrong, but what mistakes has Europe made that no developing country finance minister is likely to make, right? Because if you're a minister of finance in a developing country, you learn from history, right? You see what's happened, what's gone wrong, you know, in, in fighting crises in Brazil in the 80s or in Argentina or, you know, you, 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 you learn lessons, right? And so there are four key lessons that a policymaker in a developing country, I think, would have learned that would have been helpful for the European uh, situation. The first is, it's very difficult to jawbone markets, right? You don't jawbone markets about <clears throat> the value of your currency. You can't convince somebody that your currency is worth a lot more than the market thinks. 
And the same is true for bonds. You know, that's not the way to influence uh, bond prices by uh, jawboning. Uh, the Europeans, uh, unfortunately, took that tack. The second, and this is a standard prescription, is you don't act incrementally when you have a structural problem, right? Because it just adds to the cost, delays the inevitable. No developing country minister, if they politically can get away with it, uh, would uh, do that, and often one would go to the IMF so that the IMF can give you this bitter pill which deep in your heart you know is the right uh, medicine. Uh, so incrementalism is a mistake. Obviously, it's been played out here. The third is, if you're a central bank, and I see a number of central bank governors or former central bank governors, you don't buy distressed assets at par, right? That's, that's not smart. Um, not to mention, if you continue to buy, the inevitable write down is going to be a public sector write down instead of a private sector write down because the proportions have now shifted people are now holding it in central banks and fourth when you're worried about a debt to gdp ratio you should also uh, worry about the denominator obviously everyone's writing about this in the case of greece but one of the main reasons why imf programs failed in the past is that they only focused on the numerator Right? How are we going to bring the deficit down? How are we going to bring debt levels down? But there was no growth strategy. Right? But the IMF has learned, and developing countries have learned. So I think these are four reverse lessons that some of you in the room could probably be uh, giving to uh, Brussels uh, if you were invited uh, to give those, uh, those observations. So thanks very much. We'll give a chance to the speakers to uh, pick up on anything that they uh, wanted to uh, elaborate briefly on from the discussion and then open to the question and answers. I can add a quick footnote to the discussions uh, before I give a chance for responding. Um, capital, con capital controls. Um, so, Pedro Rivera, for example, has been talking about uh, uh, new recipes for the international monetary system. I didn't see capital controls up there in the list. What I saw is a call for more use of the euro and the yuan, but I think many of us would be skeptical that that's realistic in the near future, but the euro, as you pointed out, they are clear, doubtful in the, in the long run. In, in, if, even if the euro survives the current, the current uh, uh, cyclone, it's, it's not clear that people will be lining up to uh, buy euro reserves given the show of competence that they think, uh, given in the managing. Um, so any, that and any other point you want to pick up uh, uh, is optional, and uh, when you when you when you're done, you can go to the question now. Should I start? Do you want to start? Do we go in the order of the papers, or do you want to go in the order? Okay. So but thanks very much. Uh, these were very um, very useful and uh, um, very interesting comments. I'm going to pick on, on a couple of things that, that were mentioned. Um, and and I think there's also like some... You want me to... Yeah, yeah, the mic. Okay. That's going to make it complicated, but... Can we, I don't think we can move it over. But. Okay, so, um, very briefly, because I don't, I don't want to be giving a second speech. Um, on the, the first point is on the, this three-tiered approach that was mentioned. Uh, and on the role for self-insurance. I, I think this is absolutely right. I think, I think no country uh, in the right mind would want to give up entirely on, on self-insurance. I mean, there's, there's a notion of due diligence here. I think it's very important. Any kind of complicated multilateral arrangement could fail. You could breach four or five or six holes and, and you want to, to want to have some, some cover for that. Um, the, the question is whether you want to do only self-insurance. And I think the, the tiered approach is, is the right one. Uh, most countries now are only doing self-insurance. And so the spirit of what we're writing about is sort of maybe to move it back a little bit more in the direction of, of this multilateral agreements. Uh, the question of governance is, is of, of course, very important. And there are a lot of discussions on the side about what is the right governance of the institutions. Uh, in part, if you think about the reluctance of some countries to actually use facilities like the IMF especially in the wake of the Asian financial crisis, is because of the perception that they are not adequately represented in terms of the, of the governments of these institutions. 
Um, but if the IMF is sort of evolving more in the direction of being a provider of this liquidity, it's, it's natural that it represents also the interest of the global reserve currency providers. And in that sense, the inclusion of a country like China or maybe some other countries, maybe India eventually as global uh, currency providers, would very naturally give them uh, a, a voice in, the, in these discussions. I think they should have uh, as any sort of ultimate letter. And here the critical point is that um, you want to be thinking about global crisis. Is pulling arrangements work if the crisis is idiosyncratic? One country is hit, there's a pool of reserves, they can be allocated to that country. They stop working once the shock is global. When the shock is global, there has to be an injection of outside liquidity that can only be coming from the global reserve providers. And because they're called to duty in that particular state of the world, uh, you know, the question is how are they induced to do that? Now, sometimes it's in their self-interest. And again, as I mentioned, the Federal Reserve acted with uh, a great speed and diligence in providing liquidity, but liquidity to a small set of countries. If if India had needed liquidity, whether it would have gotten it from the Federal Reserve is, is an open question, I think. Um, okay, on the question of uh, the inclusion of um, the renminbi in uh, the, the basket, the, 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 the SDR, and the role of the SDR, I didn't dwell on this in the presentation, but in the report we're actually uh, describing why we don't think this is really uh, 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 necessarily the best way to approach the question of providing liquidity. But there is a good argument for including the SDR in the basket. Uh, now, technically, it's, we're, we're far from it right now. Technically, you're only supposed to include currencies that are freely usable, um, and the, the renminbi is not freely usable. And so, <coughs> a lot of the discussions are about whether we, we induce China to make the renminbi freely usable, and then it can be included in the SDR, or whether it's sort of an organic process where we start the discussions, and it's actually a way of facilitating the transition towards a freely usable currency, which I think eventually uh, will, will be the case. And, I think that the Chinese are actually moving in that direction. So this is sort of an organic process. Um, actually, you could even take a, a bolder view. You could say, well, we could include the SDR, the renminbi in the SDR, even if it's not fully usable. After all, this is a rule we imposed in 2000. We could scrap that rule and just put the, uh, the renminbi in there. And what it would do is it would provide a way maybe to develop the SDR on private markets. <coughs> and the reason for this is it would be a way for investors to express long positions in uh, the renminbi, which they can't express right now except through commodities market. A lot of the rise in commodity prices is coming from that. Now, capital controls very briefly, and then I stop. Um, you know, my views on, on this uh, and the views we have in the report are, are sort of in line, although, you know, uh, I have some affiliation with the IMF, but it's, it's, it's really not, uh, you know, I, I speak freely here, so I, I'm not presenting the views of the, of the fund on this. Um, but it turns out that our views are, are, are similar. The way to think about it is that we learned through this crisis that the way you implement monetary policy is with more than just policy rates. It's, 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 there are a variety of instruments. Actually, this is, we rediscovered a lesson. That's another thing that uh, you mentioned in your discussion. This is a, a, a lesson relearned, maybe, maybe forgotten in the past and relearned now. Uh, emerging and developing countries have been using a variety of instruments in implementing monetary policy. In advanced economies, we've tended to focus more and more on policy rates and nothing else. And we're rediscovering there are all kinds of other instruments that are effective on other margins. And capital controls can be part of that menu, uh, but capital controls can also be very distortive and can be dangerous. There, there can be ratcheting effects. There can be all kinds of financial protectionism that are coming indirectly through that. So I think we want to be extremely careful. And uh, the, the, the approach of the fund, I think, is the right one, which is to try to have sort of a roadmap of when and why it might be uh, 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 sort of the, the right approach as a, as a temporary measure. I mean, I emphasize temporary here because no one is advocating uh, permanent uh, permanent controls. So I will stop there. We have Pierre Olivier as Hidan. Is this on, actually? Yes. Yes, okay. On a number of points uh, very well. I don't need to go over uh, everything. But let me make a couple of uh, remarks. Uh, let me start with um, two topics you did mention, capital controls in China. Uh, one, of, one of the big uh, lessons of the crisis has been the discussion that has started on macro prudential policies. I think there's actually a lot of overlap between the macro prudential discussion and the capital control discussion. And uh, in fact, there are two distinct in principle justifications for capital controls. One of them is macro prudential, 
Uh, the other is to operate, you know, perhaps on the volume of inflows or on um, real exchange rates. And in practice, the, the effects of a capital control on these two goals could be very different. Uh, a lot of what you can accomplish by controls, you can accomplish by prudential uh, regulations. For example, um, you know, Korea has limited uh, uh, short-term uh, 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 foreign currency borrowing by its banks. Now, if that applies to any uh, sorry, foreign currency borrowing, that, that could be you know, from domestic agents, it could be from uh, foreign agents. It's not clear that it's a capital control. So there is a lot of, uh, a lot of overlap here. And at some level, if you, if you have a macro prudential goal, the capital control is probably the second best, uh, the second best intervention. So I, I like to think about it from that perspective. On China, um, I think it's way premature to talk about putting the renminbi in the, in, the, um, in, the, in the SDR basket. Uh, the the uh, uh, currency is inconvertible. It's heavily managed, which I think is a problem. Um, ultimately, uh, at the time that the RMB becomes a uh, important reserve currency, it will be appropriate to include it in the basket. And that itself will, will presuppose that China opens its uh, financial account and gets the convertibility, which is something we would actually all love to see because when that time comes, it will become impossible for China to manage its exchange rate in the way that it does now, I think, to the detriment of the international community. Um, uh, to get there, China has to do a lot in terms of reforming its domestic financial markets. Uh, you know, if you thought about the consequences of opening in the current state of affairs, uh, you know, China might well need uh, its reserves, um, uh, you know, a high measure of its reserves to deal with the resulting chaos. Okay, um, come back to the discussing specific remarks. Um, uh, you know, let me clarify something about our results on reserves. We do find that reserves are a very significant uh, predictor of crises, but one has to be careful in how one thinks about reserves because they're very endogenous. To some extent, reserves predict crises. You know, when your reserves are low, uh, it may be that the market has caught on to a problem and you're losing reserves, and of course that will predict a crisis. So it doesn't. You know, the policy implications are not as clear as they, might, uh, as they might appear. Nonetheless, I do believe that reserves were extremely helpful in the crisis for uh, a, a, a number of reasons. Um, and one way to sort of segue into that discussion is to pick up on another point that Subir made about the, uh, you know, the issue of whether emerging markets are really so different from advanced economies in terms of uh, thinking about vulnerability to crises. I, I guess what I what I would I, the way I would put the lesson of, of, of the crisis is not so much that there are no differences because I think there are differences, but there are vulnerabilities which, while while different, are, are in the same in the same family. And the lesson for policymakers is that really one has to be very careful in analyzing the structure of the uh, financial sector's balance sheet, you know, the national balance sheet. So uh, you know, let, me, let me give you some examples. Uh, for the emerging markets, a long-standing problem has been uh, original sin, uh, dollarization of liabilities, which have really limited the ability to use the exchange rate as an adjustment tool in crisis situations. You know, in the Asian crisis and other crises, uh, you, you might want to allow the exchange rate to depreciate to spur exports, to spur aggregate demand, but if you have a lot of unhedged uh, dollar debt, that kills your financial sector, it kills the balance sheets of your corporations. Um, what we found in the current crisis is that there are different but related problems in thinking about the balance sheets of advanced country institutions, and this motivated the swap lines that the LBA talked about. Uh, European banks, prior to the crisis, uh, had um, extensive short-term dollar liabilities. They were borrowing from U.S. money market funds uh, going into purchases of asset-backed securities in the U.S. And they had hedged positions uh, at one level, so you didn't really worry about currency risk. But what happened in the crisis was that um, the uh, asset side of this balance sheet became very illiquid, these dollar assets, 
uh, on the liability side, the short-term financing in dollars basically dried up. So you basically had a huge liquidity mismatch, which turned into a currency problem. Uh, European countries were not holding vast quantities of dollar reserves. And so you had a need for these swap lines to, uh, to um, basically um, shunt dollars to these institutions through the ECB and through other central banks, and in such a way that the ECB was the ultimate bearer of the uh, credit risk. On the other hand, what was the response in the emerging markets and tower reserves used? Well, uh, it was very interesting to see how in a number of countries, you know, including Peru, but also Brazil, you know, Korea, uh, reserves were used very strategically. <laughs> and basically, a uh, policymaker would look at the uh, you know, dollar liabilities in the system, uh, at the, uh, the uh, you know, sensitive, <coughs> systemically sensitive institutions, and send the dollars there so that they could unwind their dollar debts. Uh, this was favored as opposed to you know, wholesale, wholesale intervention in the exchange markets, basically funding of capital flight. And so you had cases like Korea where the yuan depreciated uh, hugely, but you didn't have financial crisis because the reserves were used to help unwind uh, positions. And that itself is a you know, very interesting story in itself um, and illustrates some of the importance of the swaps that were established by the Fed in the context of emerging markets. So it's a very interesting landscape. So I guess I would you know, disagree on perhaps some of the specific features of emerging and advanced country balance sheets, but agree on the general principle that there are balance sheet vulnerabilities and the policymaker has to be very aware of uh, exactly where those reside in order to effectively um, deal in a crisis. Um, Danny Leipziger made a number of uh, fascinating points. Um, um, and I loved his uh, discussion of uh, the Eurozone crisis. Uh, let me just focus on, on the two questions he asked, which I think are very related. Does history predict the past? And uh, how do we think about confidence? That's pretty well. <laughs> I always say that. Um, okay. Does the past predict the future? Uh, I think it does. You know, I think if we look at the mechanisms underlying these crises, there's no reason to think it'll ever be the case that when people overborrow, uh, they won't get into a situation where they can't repay their debts. That's just not not going to change. Uh, but what's what's interesting is to, to ask a sort of behavioral question. You know, underlying the pictures we showed, which seem to recur again and again and again, there's there are clearly sets of market expectations. Um, Alan Greenspan thought that. Uh, you know, markets would have rational expectations and would act in their own self-interest to, uh, if not prevent such crises, to, to limit them and to leave us in a situation where the Fed or other central banks could eas easily clean up the mess. And clearly that's not the case, but in crisis after crisis, we see um, events unfolding which in retrospect, uh, you know, one could have predicted there, there would be problems. And this is, I guess, what Ken and Carmen refer to as the, this time as this different syndrome. There seems to be, you know, some sort of progression of crises that we don't really well understand, it certainly doesn't fit into a rational framework. And, you know, Minsky and Kindleberger have uh, written about these. I think applying the insights of behavioral economics to understanding how these episodes unfold is, is, is going to be quite interesting, and I think that there are going to be tools here that we can use, the kind of you know, surveys that Bob Schiller has done of market participants' expectations. Um, you know, it might be good to be able to develop these um, data sets in the run-up to the crisis, uh, not just you know, after the crisis when people's um, you know, memories are faulty. But that's a, you know, a big project uh, for the future comment on a couple of things that were said. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to talk about uh, implementing some restrictions to capital flows, but going more into the spirit of macroprudential regulation, I think what a lot of these countries successfully implemented is macroprudential regulation in these uh, economic agents that are known to be the source of systemic risk in their own economies. What we talked a lot about was um, the banking sector, so 
uh, Chile, Peru, Korea, South Korea, they, they implemented this um, reserve requirement for dollar denominated liabilities or for foreign liabilities and that changed with the, with the maturity of those liabilities and those were successfully implemented. There were other two sources of systemic risk that I think um, we're little by little learning how to tackle. One is domestic savings actually. A lot of domestic savings tend to flow away from the economy at times of, it's not only a sudden stop in the in the in foreign capital flows, but actually even domestic private savings tend to leave. And one thing that at least Peru uh, uh, did, and, and actually Chile did at the beginning, is that they have now kind of basis of pension funds, and these pension funds themselves have a limit of how much they can have in, in, <coughs> in abroad. So they were an anchor in the amount of foreign liquidity that there was in the country and did not flow away at that time. The third source of, of systemic risk that was not actually uh, thought about prior, and now we are learning about it, is the large firms. The large firms, in the case of Peru, are mining firms, in the case of Chile as well, but in, in, in different countries you can name them, but they have direct as, uh, access to international uh, financial system. At the time of the crisis, when the international financial system actually dried up more than the domestic market, because in the domestic market the central banks were able to inject a lot of uh, international reserves, they came back to the country. And they crowded out the ones that depending on domestic uh, credit. So they were also the source of, uh, the, the ones that typically can borrow abroad, once those markets were closed, they came back and borrowed domestically. They are better funds, they are bigger, they have better assets, so they end up, uh, ended up crowding domestic uh, uh, credit of, for those firms that depend on it. That is something that uh, the, the governments of, of the, the central banks that I talked to didn't see coming. And that was an extra source of, of, of vulnerability in these economies. Uh, for that, I mean, for each, each crisis, there are a lot of valuable lessons. They, implemented a lot of them, they're still working on, on this one, but I just wanted to, to raise that comment. Thank you. Is there some time for I really wanted to ask Professor Ostfeld about all this unknown behavioral variables like contagion, spillovers, hard instinct, interlinkages of credit markets across the borders, adjustment of risk appetite in the formation of the expectations during a crisis and before the crisis. But I'll turn my guns to my dear friend, Danny Lipsider, who said something which I want to really caution people. He's advocating the supremacy of or ascendancy of the state banks for an instrument, as an instrument for a wrong goal. The state banks, and I had the privilege of privatizing most of the state banks, in Pakistan, so I can speak with experience, that they were doing such a damage both in the resource allocation for the economy, but also in magnifying the fiscal deficits. For example, the banking sector was responsible for two or three percent of the fiscal deficit. Whatever you want to do, and the central bank did in Pakistan also provided liquidity was a lender of last resort, pumped in whatever credit was required through the Ministry of Finance and through the central bank. Mm -hmm. Why do you need the state banks which are doing such a damage for this particular goal purpose? So I would caution you very much, Danny, that you are forgetting your economics, I think, by <laughs> after, after your retirement, that this is not really a very, very sound policy advice. I didn't, Receive, shut, I, I didn't advocate it, I observed it. Okay. No, I but you it. also said that this is a policy reversal. So I just wanted to make you very cautious about it because the losses to the economy in terms of the inefficiency and the fiscal are humongous and let's not try to do that. But that's my observation to uh, Danny's uh, remarks.
Uh, I've got uh, a couple of questions for uh, Professor Rafa Paul. Uh, you know, is there is there public? What's the public sector role in export mass market discoveries for your for your firm? Because that might affect. Because you know, there's a structural issue. You know, the 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 profile you saw or your firms, they survive and they die. They all have the same profile. There must be an there must be some sort of structural problem. Uh, that's one. Uh, I get uh, one thing that he has indirectly alluded to the way loans are allocated to exporters. There must be some sort of political economy issue that's going there. Uh, I'm not sure how it works in, in, in Peru, but we have we still have and we still, we have got a similar problem in Pakistan uh, in, in loan allocation. Uh, Maybe we'll give it a two ways so other people can. Sure. Should I answer now? Um, so that was my mistake. I wanted to show you the patterns for, for an average firm that dies in five years, an average firm that dies in three years, an average firm that dies in one, there are many firms that don't die, at least in our, in our, in our sample. Um, um, going to, to, to your point before, Peru used to have a big role for state uh, banks, and they dismantled it. A lot of it, after the Russian crisis, there was a huge restructuring of the banking sector. So nowadays, there's only one state government that a, a state bank that is the second door <coughs> bank for for mortgages to 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 individuals. In terms of export credit, they don't they don't provide export uh, credit to firms. It's on private uh, banks that do the thing. Yeah, uh, so and Mary, I've been right there. India Central. I guess my, I have I have two questions. The first one is for. Uh, Danny and Maury, uh, perhaps, um, and maybe Pierre Olivier. Uh, so what struck me about this crisis for the emerging markets is that they had the courage to undertake counter-cyclical uh, policies generally, particularly monetary policies, in a way that I don't think they would have risked or didn't risk in the Asia crisis. And uh, the question really is, is why? Is it, is it basically because of the success of self-insurance in, in the meantime? I mean, all of the things that the Koreans, etc., actually did this time, and the Indians, I think we wouldn't have thought uh, were, were, were safe, that markets would not have condoned them. This time markets condoned them. And the question is, is this because the perception of improvements in fundamentals had gone that far? And just to add to this discussion on uh, state uh, domestic versus foreign banks. Uh, I mean, in the 80s, there was the sense that the way you cheapened your regulation or made, made your regulatory life easier was to import regulation by <coughs> foreign banks in there. The Uruguayans did that, the New Zealanders did that. So I'd be interested what the panel thinks of, you know, uh, the, the state of play at the moment. Are basically foreign banks guarantors of anything or are they Trojan horses? Well, um, it's a long... We can collect more questions, perhaps, mm -hmm. and then... Uh... Okay. Thank you very much. My name is Kolu Adakaye. I come from uh, Nigeria. Um, mine is a question I want to seek from Professor Rappaport. Um Foreign credits by firms, are they used as working capital in Peru, or they are used to finance import of capital goods? Because that would then have a example the way you, I mean, it affects the real sector of the economy. If it is uh, to finance uh, capital, I mean, investment actually for expansion, then uh, it's effectively different from if it is used to finance you know, uh, working capital. And if it's working capital, is it because of uh, a kind of uh, production to meet specific demand by you know uh, uh, an, an importer from country? And why or how does it actually work? <laughs> yeah, uh, my question is to uh, Professor Rapopo. Uh, she has made a very good presentation on credit uh, shocks um, as a Peruvian export. But uh, there are other developing countries which are affected, I mean, during that uh, recession, uh, which were affected more by other factors like price, uh, falling price, and uh, falling market demand in uh, developed societies. So uh, it will be interesting to know, I mean, is there any uh, assessment made uh, on uh, how much of Peruvian export was affected not by the credit shocks, but by uh, the falling demand in uh, advanced economies and 
Also, you have mentioned about the falling commodity prices. Yes. So, uh, and uh, whether uh, there was any effect uh, by this falling commodity price. Uh, my question is about this self insurance mechanism. Uh, it's nationalistic, but it has this cost. I mean, of course, it saves time in the time, moment of a crisis because you depend on your own resources and people don't try to uh, speculate with the economy. So, there are a lot of advantages. But if every country follows that rule, what is the cost to the global economy? Has there been any study of that sort? And what could be a self insurance mechanism? How could some mechanism be replaced? An insurance mechanism, of course. That would be, can potentially replace the self insurance, maybe through IMF or through other channels, which can, with some changes in the governance structure or some kind of automaticity like premium arrangement, you can have a cheaper option to self insure. Is that possible on a market based system? Thank you. Okay, last, last question. And yeah, my question is for the Honorable Deputy Governor, and this is uh, a lot of question of query. Regarding uh, remittances, which have become very important capital inflows into developing economies, at the moment remittances are much higher than the total aid flows coming into developing economies. And in the last eight, ten years, they have increased enormously. And in the case of Pakistan, something like one billion to almost twelve billion dollars a year, going up to six percent. Obviously, in India also, the remittances have almost increased. What? In their view is sort of the factor which is leading to this rise is if basically the people under some certain outside are sending in back remittances or there's a change in the skill composition of people center. And secondly, uh, or is it sort of black money being like that? And finally, is it sort of, is this, a, should this be an area of concern for governments that this, given the nature of the situation which may change and the vulnerability of countries to remittances, whether, you know, how one could sort of try to ensure some ways of protecting against them. Okay, we have five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> or more rapidly than the banks with low. <coughs> After the crisis, they dropped dramatic, dramatically the amount they lent, and the ones with low share of liabilities, they increased a lot. So on average, this economy worked much better on average, the central bank managed to inject liquidity at the time of the crisis. <coughs> However, there were interesting discrepancies across banks. Why do we care? In principle, the firms that were borrowing from, from, high, from banks with high foreign liabilities, they could just go to the healthy banks and borrow from them. One turns out, turns out that they couldn't. And the reason they couldn't is because banks tend to develop expertise. And we know that Banks tend to develop expertise on their clients. They know the clients, so they cannot, the clients cannot easily substitute one bank with the other. What we discovered here is that banks actually develop expertise in market, in export markets. If you look at HSBC, the, the bank with uh, higher share of fund liabilities, they have a clear expertise in U.S. market. So most of the firms that borrow from, the US, from, from HSBC are exporting to the U.S. On the other side of the, of, of the equation, Santander, with very low share fund liabilities, has come, none of the firms that borrow from Santander <coughs> are actually exporting to the U.S. So an exporter the, uh, to the U.S. cannot just abandon HSBC and ask for a loan in Santander. Basically, Santander is not uh, uh, specialized in this market. So then we can see what was the effect of this in the resulting uh, expo performance of the firms. Well, banks that had credit, uh, banks that had a, a foreign liabilities above the mean basically ended up dropping credit supply by 17%, and we were able to uh, compute the elasticity, that is, how much export response to 1% change in credit, <coughs> in credit stock. For the quantities exporting, of firms that continue exporting, and the number of firms that continue exporting. Why do we care about these numbers? Well, the central bank in Peru is using these numbers to simulate different credit scenarios. So with these numbers, they're able to put it into different calibration models and uh, evaluate different counterfactuals. 
if we want to put it in perspective, what we have here is the, is the, the performance of Peru before and after the reversal of capital flow. <coughs> Peru's exports were growing at almost 11% before. They dropped 22% afterwards. Most of it is coming from the change in prices. If we see volumes, they were growing at only 3%, so a lot of the growth in the pre-period was coming from the commodity <coughs> price boom. Dropped 10% afterwards, so in total, in volumes, the missing trade was something like uh, 13%. Finance at the end accounts for 15% of it. So this is a first order effect, but most of the drop in export was coming from uh, aggregate demand and aggregate prices. Finance is actually big in explaining the amount of exports for those firms that continue exporting, but cannot explain the number of firms that abandon exporting to different markets. So there are a lot of uh, uh, firms that develop uh, a market and they just abandon it altogether. And this is coming from the deterioration in the, in the, in the business opportunities and not coming from, from, from supplier credits. The other thing we did is uh, look how different was the reaction of, uh, according to the characteristics of the firm, the market or the, or the product. The first thing we looked at is the size of the firm. Not surprisingly, we found that small firms were more, more affected by the credit supply shock, but not because the small firms are more sensitive to credit. What we found is that the shock is bigger for small firms. When banks cut credit, they cut credits to small firms more and, 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 and relatively more and faster. Similarly, we found that <coughs> Exporting to neighboring, exports to neighboring countries are the ones that get affected the most. And again, it's because the firms that, um, the firms that, that, that are specialized in exporting to far away countries are stronger and they don't suffer credit much as much as the ones that export nearby. And the ones that basically cut, uh, they, they decide to abandon the, an export market are the, are the ones that have the small export flows. The other thing that Peru was actually very interested about is that differentiated products tend to be more sensitive to credit than commodities. This is something that they care because they're trying to promote differentiated products uh, and, and they got badly hit by the crisis. So going back to our agenda, these are the first, the three questions we posted. Um, how do shocks to banks affect the real economy? Uh, do banks provide services apart from credit intermediation and how the firms use external credit. Let me recap it one by one what we learn about it. The first one is how banks participate, how banks uh, uh, interact with the, with the global financial markets in a way that firms do not. So as soon as that happens, they have a role in the international transmission of prices. What was different about this crisis relative to other ones, and potentially because of the nature of the crisis, is that in this case, uh, multinational banks were equally vulnerable than domestic banks. Even more, multinational banks sometimes tend to have higher share of foreign liabilities, and that was the main predictor of the, of the credit shock, irrespectively of whether it was owned by an international bank or not. It did affect the quantities exporting for continuing export lines and also increased the exit of, ex of existing uh, small lines. We got the numbers, so we're able to calibrate it with different uh, uh, scenarios of credit shocks. In terms of the design of prudential bank regulation, I think the, Peru, the experience in Peru was quite good. The reserve requirements, they, they had reserve requirements for foreign denominated uh, liabilities, and these reserve requirements were particularly high for short-term debt. So short-term foreign uh, uh, debt was, had a, a big reserve requirement, also almost 35%, and that dropped for longer term. And that reduced the magnitude of the shocks to the banks because the banks had lower uh, foreign liabilities relative to before, but also that went to the construction of these 
contracyclical for, uh, funds, so they were able to inject international liquidity at the time of the crisis. The only thing that they didn't see coming is that, um, although they were quite successful in reducing the spread for, for dollar debt uh, in, in, in the, the Peruvian banking sector, what they didn't see coming is that the, the heterogeneous uh, impact across banks was also important. And it was important because banks have expertise. So they couldn't just, firms couldn't just replace uh, a distressed bank with a healthy bank. The one source of expertise that we discovered here is that expertise in markets. One thing that we are now doing is trying to identify what are the sources of expertise. Are they, do they have knowledge in a given product just because the, the, the bank has more present in the geographic area? and that geographic area is connected to a product? Or do they have a knowledge in the, in the destination because they need export, uh, banks that, that, that assist in exports, they need to have a counterpart in the destination country uh, for the letters of credit. So maybe that connection is something that cannot just easily be replaced. And on that I want to, to, to stress one program by the IDB, the, the uh, uh, Inter-American Development Bank, uh, that basically has a portfolio of, of, of counterparty in destination markets, so they do the intermediation of letters of credit. So if these end up being the, the source of this uh, expertise in product destination, these type of programs are the ones that we have to take into account. This is exactly what we are currently working on. The other thing we need to, to, to disentangle is the use of external credit by firms. What we discovered with this, uh, with this project is that firms use credit in production. Not only in investment, not only in opening new, 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 new markets, but actually what is crucial is that they need it for working capital. So even when you have a really bad recession, investment in Peru was almost at zero at the time of the crisis. No firm virtually open new markets, you have a big impact in quantities. And this is because the firms actually needed credit as one factor of production to finance working capital. Um, of course, this is a very short response to a, to, to, to a credit supply shock. What we need to know is what happens in the longer term. And one, one thing that we, that we are looking at is uh, trying to understand the, the usage of credit in the export dynamics. What you have here is firms, is the, the average export dynamic of a firm that is, in, in, is exporting on average of five years. So this is the time of exporting. This is the time zero when they start of exporting. And this is when they die after five years. This is one that is two years exporting and then dies. This is one year exporting and then dies. This is an export. It might be that it's a life afterwards. This is the dynamic of credit during the time. What you see is that there's a little bit of a hump here at the time they start exporting, but continuously rises and follows whatever happens in the quantities here. So it looks like it's not just uh, that, that credit is not what we use to enter the market to, to invest in networking of uh, a distribution channels, but actually something that needs to follow the production patterns of the firm. So based on this, we, we will be able to understand access to credit as one source of, of uh, industry promotion and export promotion, because what, the, what at least Peru is, is, is concerned is that it became really good in preventing the shock from affecting the economy but it's still access to credit is really low, uh, and, and we want to understand it better in the long term process. Great, thank you. Uh,
steps into uh, the academic role, which I uh, just given my my past interests. Uh, I think the the three papers that uh, were presented today uh, at least provided me a very logically consistent picture of uh, various dimensions of capital flows and particularly shocks to these flows. So I'm going to uh, structure my remarks in a somewhat different order because that's the way I saw the, the fit. Uh, I'm going to start with the last paper which I saw as essentially reflecting uh, the microeconomic consequences of uh, capital flow disruptions and then build up to Maury's paper which so it takes a macro perspective on the on the implications, if you will, the symptoms of uh, of crisis, and finally to Pierre Oliver's, which then talks about well, how, what 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 can the system do about it? Uh, as uh, Veronica said, this is perhaps a unique data set. I, I'm not uh, certainly in the Indian context. We don't have this kind of matching of firm level data from the customs side and the banking side. Uh, but it obviously offers uh, a very, very significant resource in terms of establishing uh, the connection between uh, credit disruptions and uh, real economic activity. And certainly as a central bank, it, it is something that uh, we uh, are extremely conscious of because a lot of our uh, conversations with, uh, particularly with the industry associations and, and representatives of, of the real sector, so to speak, uh, revolve around this issue of you know we're not getting enough money or it's it's uh, too expensive is one thing that's that's uh, a matter of you know, complaint about interest rates and so on, but there are often concerns about supplies about the availability of credit that uh, certain uh, seg segments of industry simply find it difficult to get credit and the uh, the comparisons are all, all often made with. Uh, the big companies who have it so easy, they can just go out uh, to the international markets and borrow, uh, and particularly given the arbitrage that exists now, uh, that it's very attractive for them to borrow from outside. Uh, so there's a kind of an asymmetry that seems to emerge from uh, the, uh, post the from the disruption of credit. Smaller companies tend to get hit much harder, and uh, there are opportunities to leverage or to borrow from outside, directly or through banks, however, uh, is uh, much more limited than it is for larger companies. Uh, so while at a macro level, we don't typically think of distributional impacts of uh, credit disruptions, uh, it's a very clear uh, consequence. It is a very real and very tangible consequence of this. And I think this paper really highlights uh, it, of course, from a different perspective, because here the linkage is between banks that uh, fund their uh, borrowing capacity, their lending capacity from outside versus banks that fund their lending capacity from inside. And typically in a situation where uh, banks that borrow abroad are impacted in terms of their access to funds, that segment of firms uh, obviously has become impacted, which is what the paper shows. Uh, when we look back, or I look back at the way in which the financial system, the regulatory system dealt with the crisis in India, I wasn't part of it then, I was an observer from the outside. Uh, liquidity was absolutely a critical factor. I think the, uh, we look back on how we managed to avoid perhaps the, the most, uh, the worst case consequences of the crisis. Uh, one important element to it, which is probably a little under-recognized in the overall debate, is how much liquidity was pumped through the system in order to meet uh, the credit requirements of companies. Uh, there are several sectors that will now probably say that it was this sort of unusual and, and uh, disproportionate uh, infusion of liquidity that actually allowed them to continue uh, to function. Uh, real estate is one very prominent, of example of, well, very prominent example of this, but there are also other sectors in which the infusion of liquidity proved to be uh, a very powerful sort of buffer against not so much capital inflows, but just the overall shock to the financial system. Uh, of course, the flip side of this is a lot of the, uh, the, the bad, if you will, was included with the good because in that situation, it's very difficult to differentiate or discriminate between 
projects that are inherently viable or companies that are inherently viable but are just being squeezed from for liquidity versus companies that are basically uh, weak and are unlikely to survive beyond the immediate liquidity infusion. And that has resulted uh, as we come out of the crisis uh, in a situation uh, where a lot of uh, non performing <coughs> asset build up is being seen because companies that might have proved to be unviable in the normal course of events got the infusion, survived for a bit, and then uh, as things normalize, uh, we, at least the banking system is finding out that these are proving to be a problem. So it is, in a sense, a bit of a postponement of the uh, of, of the na natural order of uh, uh, development of non-performing assets. Uh, but the issue of uh, managing liquidity, of ensuring that liquidity flows remain undisrupted, I think is a very, very important uh, aspect of crisis management. And not just at the macro level, not just the aggregate, but in terms of being able to deliver this to individual firms particularly vulnerable sectors and the Peruvian case is an export dominated or, uh, or export significant economy that wasn't so much the case in the Indian context. Uh, but uh, companies can die if, if credit isn't available and uh, certainly from an analytical viewpoint I think I do take some significant lessons from this in terms of being able to link up uh, the state of different companies and their access to credit in terms of predicting both the unfolding of NPAs and perhaps the uh, larger aggregate performance of different sectors. Uh, Maury's paper uh, actually in, at one level makes life much simpler for uh, us as policy makers because uh, we're used to looking at dashboards in a rather sort of messy and sometimes disorganized way. Uh, so everybody has their own view of what is important in anticipating crisis, in managing even normal macroeconomic uh, conditions. And so when you take the sum total of everybody who has an input into this dashboard, uh, you often end up finding yourself uh, with a lot of variables to look at, not a very clear idea of what connects them, and uh, decision making then becomes somewhat uh, difficult. Uh, of all the variables that uh, we looked at uh, in this evolution of crisis, uh, the fact that we can pin it down to uh, the critical ones down to a list of three, I think uh, is of, of great significance and it uh, adds, I think, a lot of value in terms of being able to cut across uh, the whole spectrum of countries here. Uh, one very significant point that uh, the paper makes is uh, well sort of I suppose building uh, going back to this this time is different theme uh, is that there isn't really any difference uh, you, you don't really need to control for uh, level of affluence for sophistication of the financial sector all of the things that we've as the, the, the presentation also indicate the structural vulnerabilities of emerging market economies tended to put them into a sort of a distinct category with a distinct uh, with a need for distinct solutions uh, or distinct policy approaches and at least uh, the, the study, the, the analytics of the study not just focused on the most recent crisis but obviously influenced by it, uh, suggests that well basically you need to look at these three things. Uh, I think liquidity is uh, very intuitive, uh, the build up of liquidity, uh, uh, sorry not liquidity, leverage uh, is very intuitive, the build up of leverage in the system even though it was confined in this paper to the banking system exclusively, uh, I think it is reasonable to argue that uh, the shadow banking system also draws off the banking system, so in a sense it does become a bit of a proxy for the overall level of leverage in the, in the economy. Uh, that, that, is very, uh, that is intuitively very appealing. Uh, the real exchange rate uh, and its components because uh, that captures both uh, exchange rate movements or misalignments if you will and uh, inflation dynamics. So the combination of these two becoming a sort of predictor of crisis if the real exchange rate is is, uh, is out of misalignment, is, is out of alignment either because of, uh, of nominal movements or because of inflation uh, 
uh, this becomes a sort of predictor of, uh, of a crisis. Uh, and the third, uh, which actually then leads neatly into uh, the point being made uh, in, in uh, Pierre Oliver's paper, is uh, the significance of having protective buffer. Uh, this is not a very straightforward causal connection as uh, I think the paper also points out. But the fact that uh, economies that had built up, for whatever reason, some degree of protective uh, buffers, uh, which helped them then smoothen out their performance uh, during the crisis, I think is an important one. Uh, I think conceptually you could argue that protection is what is needed. Protection is what is uh, what worked, and reserves per se are not a terribly efficient way of, of achieving that protection, there are more efficient ways of achieving it, which I think the premise of the, uh, of the last paper, or the last paper that, that uh, I, I'm going to refer to in terms of my sequence. Uh, and uh, so then it comes down to, well, if protection is good, uh, what uh, is the best way or what is the most efficient way to, to achieve it? But before I get to that point, uh, I think another very important sequence that uh, Maurice paper laid out was uh, a sort of a morphology, if I could call it that, how do crises unfold. And uh, you can move from currency to banking to, to sovereign in a particular sequence depending on how uh, policy makers or regulators respond to uh, specific developments. Uh, they can be contained or uh, they, can, uh, they can cascade. Uh, based on what the response is to the first uh, development, the first unfolding is. And I think that's, that's a, a sort of a, uh, a story that again from our viewpoint as policy makers, the idea of early warning systems, what do we look for, uh, what are the consequences of acting in a particular way in response to a given development. Uh, I think those are important questions which we grapple with uh, as we go about our daily business. Uh, which is that uh, every action uh, has a counterpart, an alternative action or a non-action, each of which has certain consequences and it's, it's getting handled on all of these is, is quite uh, complicated. Uh, but I think the, uh, I, I, uh, I use the, the tyrannic metaphor often. Uh, I find it very convenient to, to, uh, to understand or to, to communicate a lot of the situations that uh, we deal with. And here I think the, uh, the titanic metaphor is very appropriate because you essentially have a situation where uh, there are in the titanic, uh, there were automatic buffers. If you, if you damage the hull in one place, uh, you were immediately able to isolate it because these barriers would come uh, down and prevent the water from, from spilling over the rest of the ship, thereby destabilizing it. And of course, the Titanic got hit by an iceberg which cut through five or six of those chambers. So protective devices that were in place were simply <coughs> not enough to, uh, to, to prevent the ship from sinking. Uh, and I think a, a crisis a little bit like that. It is, you have all these safety nets, so these, these fail safes, these devices in place, early warnings, action uh, plans, and so on. Uh, and then when it does hit, it often just takes everything down with it, which makes it virtually impossible to implement any of these plans, uh, which is where the, uh, the reform of the international monetary system uh, becomes an issue. And uh, I think the main uh, focus of, of that paper from my perspective uh, was whether we can create a global insurance mechanism that uh, actually offsets or neutralizes some of the disadvantages of the existing system, not just at a multilateral level, but also at, uh, at a national level. Uh, if we are to take the very simple uh, view that, look, I'm not going to rely on anybody else to protect myself in a crisis situation, uh, because I just can't trust anybody in that situation. It's, it's nice to have all of these agreements and arrangements and groups in place, uh, contracts if in, uh, in place uh, when things are going well. Uh, but uh, in a crisis, everybody rushing to, to save themselves, are these actually enforceable, are they going to work? Uh, 
uh, and why should I leave myself vulnerable to uh, the possibility of a system that I've depended on uh, not working? Comes back to this sort of Titanic uh, uh, situation. And there I think the, the idea of self-insurance is very critical. Uh, I, I, at least from our perspective, uh, any reform of the international monetary system which creates more efficient ways of dealing with uh, individual country stresses by pooling resources uh, either in a sort of regional formation, we have a number of those, the bilateral swaps, uh, or a, a much more comprehensive multilateral framework. Uh, I think if it, if it ignores the, the, I would say the compulsion, uh, not just the rational need, but the compulsion for, uh, for self-insurance, it's really not going to find much traction. Uh, Maureen and I were at a seminar last week where uh, there was a lot of gloom about uh, the effectiveness of international agreements in situational <coughs> crisis uh, because of a variety of reasons that, uh, that many people talked about. And here I think the, the recognition of self-insurance and perhaps from that point on looking at, the, uh, at, at some perhaps uh, formality uh, or formalization of, of optimality under what conditions I think makes a lot of sense. Uh, we do have uh, the rule that was cited, the Greenspan green Guidotti. It's a rule of thumb, it's a convenient way to, to measure your degree of self-insurance, but perhaps there are more uh, sophisticated ways of, of addressing this issue, and I think that would be an important sort of a technical uh, research topic that, uh, that I would certainly suggest. Uh, but moving from there to then making insurance more uh, efficient, uh, currency composition, uh, the current basket of uh, the SDR and the role that new currencies, particularly the Chinese Yuan would play, uh, the heat map was very revealing because the heat map suggested, as uh, <coughs> Pierre Oliver also uh, inferred, uh, that uh, countries that are not yet in the system are still actually playing something of a role in providing this reserve currency. And I don't know how this unfolded and that, that itself may be uh, an issue for, uh, for discussion. Uh, but when you look at the possibility of, of expanding the SDR uh, to include the Yuan, uh, clearly all the technical arguments come in the way. It's, it's, it's issue of convertibility, the issue of open capital account, uh, where the, the nature of, of transactions and so on. And there are a whole bunch of, uh, of conditions which one can identify which say, well, you know, this is not uh, a currency that could be included. Uh, but uh, I think the fundamental point that the paper makes is very important, which is that if you don't do that, uh, you're really basing the whole multilateral risk management system on a very narrow set of currencies. And the ability of these, these, uh, these financial systems, these, these currency systems, to actually cater to a crisis of more than uh, you know, minor or, or you know, uh, in significant magnitude uh, is going to be is clearly in <coughs> doubt. So we need to move to a system that uh, does expand the capacity, and there are all these elements. And so from our viewpoint, we've always been looking at a three-tier process, which is self-insurance as the base, and that's something that I don't think any country which has developed it so far is ever going to give up. Uh, Plural, plurilateral or bilateral agreements as a sort of second tier where swaps and uh, you know arrangements like the Chiang Mai are a sort of a way of pooling resources reasonably with some objectivity in terms of the criterion and the conditionalities. Uh, we have something going with uh, the SARC as, as a sort of pilot in terms of providing liquidity to the six countries that surround us much smaller in, in terms of the requirements and so on, but it's, it's an experiment in, in regional cooperation, which is very important. And uh, finally, the multilateral. And so what is the capacity that this system needs? Uh, how is it going to fund it? And how is it going to be governed, most importantly? Because I think the, uh, the, the final point I will make from, uh, from uh, with regard to Maury's paper is uh, since every country is, is prone to a crisis under essentially the same conditions, uh, governance therefore has to reflect this fact, that this is not uh, an exclusive set of countries that are prone to crisis and therefore 
should be subject to a different set of rules or, or uh, conditions. Uh, everybody is equally vulnerable. Uh, the indications and symptoms are quite similar across the world. And uh, so the insurance system, the international monetary system, uh, needs to be governed in a way which reflects this. So uh, I hope those were useful comments. Uh, thank you again for this opportunity. Well, good morning and uh, thanks to the IGC for um, asking me to uh, comment. I think I'm supposed to make a broad link between the academic and the policy side, perhaps because I was uh, uh, the Vice President of Economic Policy at the World Bank until 2009. So I'll try to do two things in my short amount of time. One is offer a few observations on the three papers and then uh, offer some broader uh, thoughts on the topic of macro and capital, uh, and capital account, basically. Um, uh, on Maury's paper, uh, I think uh, it tells us uh, a great deal. It particularly tells us uh, that fundamentals uh, matter, not only in explaining how the emerging market economies seem to have weathered the crisis, the recent one, better than others, uh, but also among them, why the Central Europeans uh, did particularly badly. Um, I think the other contribution, of course, is that it disaggregates beyond the Reinhard Rogoff uh, kind of analysis to tell us uh, what we can look for in each type of crisis. If you remember the paper by Stein Klassen, he showed that there were 122 recessions that he looked at in the post-World War II period, and only four of them combined banking crises, stock market crises, and housing collapses. So the ability to find out uh, additively um, uh, what causes and uh, what the implications of these prices are, I think, is very uh, valuable. Um, I have basically two questions on that uh, paper, but on more on that type of analysis, uh, Reinhard Rogoff in particular. And that's the question as to whether or not uh, the historical data is really uh, a good predictor for the future. If you believe that the state of the world has somewhat changed and the paradigms are different, uh, particularly the empirics are different, uh, then you may not be so convinced by historical analyses uh, of crisis, particularly when it gets to the empirical side. Um, the second is that what I uh, lack in all of the uh, analyses recently, which uh, I think is relevant, is the role of confidence, right? I mean, at the moment, uh, the, well, the, in the U.S., for example, there was a debate during the time of the stimulus package between Christina Romer and Robert Barra about the size of the multiplier. Uh, it turned out Barra was probably more right than wrong, but for the wrong reasons. It wasn't Ricardian equivalence. Uh, it was lack of confidence or absolute fear uh, that uh, made people <coughs> reluctant to spend. So my question there is uh, whether or not one can't build some more aspects of behavioral economics, essentially, uh, into these uh, predictive kind of models. Uh, on P Pierre Olivier's paper, I, I have large agreement areas um, on the f need for alternative uh, currencies, uh, limited role for SDRs really as a, as a solution to the problem. Uh, he endorses a sort of targeted capital controls as the way the IMF now defines it as being uh, an okay policy. I guess my only question there is on the Chinese in particular. There seems to be a time inconsistency with, with respect to what one expects of the renminbi perhaps as a reserve currency and the fact that they are so far from uh, convertibility and other attributes that you would associate with a reserve uh, currency. Not saying that the behavior of the dollar has been exemplary, but just uh, the Chinese currency seems a far, uh, a far cry from that. Uh, and then on Veronica's paper, I thought it was very interesting to see you know, what the role of uh, uh, lack of credit was compared to uh, this drop in demand in Peru. Uh, apparently, the credit channel is less, was less damaging in Peru, uh, in part because local banks were able to step in. Um, I think there are a few points there. One is that, uh, particularly for a country like Peru, if you, if you lose your part of your export share, uh, export market, I think it's going to be rather hard to regain. So I think, you know, the fact that credit was a, con a, a secondary constraint may not be the big issue. Uh, when demand comes back, uh, Peruvian exports may not be there. Um, 
in other countries other than Peru, uh, it wasn't the private banks that stepped in to provide credit. So if you think about Brazil or India, uh, they were state banks. And uh, that's a more complicated story if state banks are the ones making up for this uh, lack of international uh, credit because state banks uh, tend usually to have some other objectives in mind. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that Peru basically, if I understood correctly, uh, follows somewhat the Chilean reserve requirement of the uh, previous decades, which was much reviled, uh, hard to empirically show what its impact was, but I believe actually was the very interesting policy for Chile that protected it during the uh, Latin American crises. Um, let me turn now to the area of policy advice, and many of you in the, uh, in the room are probably attending this conference to uh, come away with uh, what's new and different uh, in terms of uh, the topics being uh, covered. Um, so I'd like to offer a few thoughts on three things. The lessons of the crisis, uh, what's new in policy advice, and then something I call reverse lessons. Uh, but I'll do it briefly, so have no fear. In the 80s and then the early 90s, and culminated maybe with the East Asian financial crisis, really uh, um, pushed a number of countries to try to sort of self-insure on a much bigger scale and try to reduce our vulnerabilities. And clearly that, that helped them. They came into this crisis with much fewer uh, vulnerabilities in terms of financing, either of the government or external financing, and therefore there was much less room for uh, uh, the withdrawal of capital flows to actually hurt the economy. It was, it was a very huge sudden stop for uh, most emerging, emerging economies that, uh, uh, during that time. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that uh, lessons can be learned from history and they can be unlearned. And, and having a successful crisis is wonderful, but it also can lead to a sense of complacency and a sense that somehow we know now how to deal with crisis. And, and I, would, I would think that emerging and developing countries want to be careful about that because we see in some of them, uh, in terms of the indicators that, uh, that uh, Moy and I emphasize in our work, we see some of these indicators sort of becoming sort of starting to flash red. Uh, in, in a number of these countries. So lessons uh, from history should be learned. Self-insurance, absolutely. How much from the market economy can we get? Um, well, I wouldn't put too much hope in it. Um, and I think even in terms of sort of, um, uh, uh, sort of managed governance and institutions we can put together, I think there's also a very, very narrow path and, and probably uh, uh, you know, very limited will to, uh, to do something systemic there. Uh, well, let me sort of say something narrow um, about self-insurance and uh, try to touch on, on this issue of contagion also. Um, you know, again, I think the experience of Korea is a very um, uh, instructive one for thinking about the crisis because it shows the, you know, sort of the cost of self-insurance um, in the in sort of current reserve system. So Korea started the crisis with 160 billion or so in reserves, and it spent down 60 billion uh, you know, fairly quickly. And they, they didn't want to go below 100 billion. That was sort of a line in the sand that the authorities drew. And they were just worried that, uh, you know, they had issued a lot of guarantees to the financial sector. They wanted to maintain confidence, and they thought that 100 billion was the lower limit that we do that. And as a result, when the 30 billion in Federal Reserve swaps came in, this was this was a godsend. And this was wonderful, and these were these were used. But it illustrates one of the problems of the, the, the system of self-insurance, which is uh, and the problem of contagion. You know, how 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 what stock of reserves is enough? You know, if your region has been hit by a negative shock, and uh, uh, foreign investors are selling off your assets. Uh, they're trying to figure out you know, which countries are going to be strong and which are going to be weak. And the ones that are holding more reserves are going to look stronger. Uh, those who use reserves will be more subject to the contagious shock. So there's a kind of danger of an arms race in this reserve field where countries just build up more and more because no amount is really enough because you have to look better than the next country. And, uh, you know, that's why I think that it's important to have another tier, as Pierre Olivier put it, of liquidity support facilities, uh, because um, you know, otherwise nothing's 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 really enough. And of course, those may have limits; they may have fees. There are lots of ways to structure them, and that's an important part of the reform agenda for developing countries. And just to take the self-insurance to the extreme, 
you know, self-insurance means holding claims on other countries. It doesn't mean total independence from other countries. So maybe you're holding claims on the U.S. Are these claims necessarily uh, going to be good in a crisis? You know, ultimately that logic takes you to the, uh, the solution of holding gold in your vaults. And we do see central banks increasingly buying gold. You know, for a country like, like Libya, uh, during its crisis, you know, gold, you know, gold was the ultimate, uh, uh, the ultimate asset that couldn't be seized by the international community. Uh, so there, you, you, even this, the, 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 the issue of self-insurance and having unconditionality you know, has its limits. Extreme limits, yes, but limits nonetheless. Um, so I wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, first, about the role of foreign state and domestic banks. Um, we compare this crisis with the Russian crisis. In the Russian crisis, foreign banks were actually much less vulnerable than, than domestic banks. This is not the case in this crisis, and probably because the nature of the two crises were different. In this case, it was in the center of the, of the developed world, so in multinational uh, banks were as vulnerable as, uh, as domestic In terms of the state banks, they played a a crucial point of cyclical role in, in Brazil, for example. But at the time of, of thinking of the state banks as um, contra cyclical mechanisms, we have to also keep in mind uh, what are the most usual uh, sources of shock for, for, for our economy, and many times this fiscal crisis. And in those cases, the state banks are not going to help us much. So uh, we have to take the two into account. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is about the external, the, the, the use of, of credit by the fund, that I think you asked. Um, so, so it changes a lot during this cycle. So in the, in the middle of the crisis, you have a lot of redundant capacity, redundant uh, of physical capacity. In those moments, actually, physical, cap physical capital is not what firms are after. So at that time, the crucial role of credit is working capital. But I don't want to stretch this too much because if the credit is important for the firm in a more dynamic way in the longer term, and then investment in physical capital very crucial. So I'm talking about only in the moment of the stress. And, and also for Peru, the big drop in export was due to international demand and international prices. What, what credit at the end of the day is is accounting for is just 15% of the drop in volume, not in value of export. So Peru suffered a lot from the drop in international uh, demand for the product. That was the big, the, the big a, 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 a shock for, for export, way more than, than the credit supply. Uh, I think the question on remittance is uh, very important. Uh, some recent research that uh, we just had uh, in India very good, not not very easy to, to accept, uh, but clearly suggesting that the numbers, the aggregate numbers, and what households perceive as uh, as their remittance inflows are what are the line. So I suspect it's a, it's all of the above because there is clearly a, a large uh, labor force, new sort of delta to the labor force coming from different parts of the country going first time to migrate over there. That's adding to it. There's possibly uh, some sort of uh, what, what one might call disguised capital flows in this. And uh, so, you know, there are two ways to deal with it. One is to say, look, let's not bring remittances into the current account at all, just treat it as a you know, capital account or, or something apart. Uh, which I think would be extreme. Uh, there is another which is to try and make some estimate of what one might call remittances at risk, which is some component of the remittance flow that is probably attributable to things other than labor income being, uh, being sent back. Uh, that's that's something that I think uh, is a research agenda for us. Then you get the last word. Well, on Suman's question, I think um, uh, basically countries were in better fiscal shape, but they had also self-insured in, in the Korea case, and if we learned how this crisis was different in Korea than in 97, uh, because they had uh, much higher levels of reserves and the swaps were helpful.
Um, the final word is to Ishra to ensure him that since I left the World Bank, my economics have actually been better. <laughs> 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 Thank you the speakers and the discussants for uh, everybody who was here for a very uh, stimulating uh, discussion. I think there is lunch downstairs.